Chapter 2 Elements of Chaos Heat Death Humans, like all mammals, are heat engines. Surviving means having to continually cool off, as panting dogs do. For that, the temperature needs to be low enough for the air to act as a kind of refrigerant, drawing heat off the skin so the engine can keep pumping. At 7 degrees of warming, that would become impossible for portions of the planet's equatorial band, and especially the tropics, where humidity adds to the problem, and the effect would be fast. After a few hours, a human body would be cooked to death from both inside and out. At 11 or 12 degrees Celsius of warming, more than half the world's population, as distributed today, would die of direct heat. Things almost certainly won't get that hot anytime soon, though some models of unabated emissions do bring us that far eventually, over centuries. But at just 5 degrees, according to some calculations, whole parts of the globe would be literally unsurvivable for humans. At 6, summer labor of any kind would be impossible in the lower Mississippi Valley. And everybody in the United States, east of the Rockies, would suffer more from heat than anyone anywhere in the world today. New York City would be hotter than present day Bahrain, one of the planet's hottest spots. And the temperature in Bahrain would induce hypothermia in even sleeping humans. 5 or 6 degrees is unlikely by 2100. The IPCC furnishes us with a median prediction of over 4 degrees, should we continue down the current emissions path. That would deliver what today seems like unthinkable impacts, wildfires burning 16 times as much land in the American West, hundreds of drowned cities. Cities, now home to millions, across India and the Middle East, would become so hot that stepping outside in summer would be a little risk. In fact, they will become that way much sooner, with as little as 2 degrees of warming. You do not need to consider worst case scenarios to become alarmed. With direct heat, the key factor is something called weight bulb temperature, which also measures humidity in a combined method as home laboratory kit as it sounds. The temperature is registered on a thermometer wrapped in a damp sock as it's sung around in the air. At present, most regions reach a weight bulb temperature of 26 or 27 degrees Celsius. The true red line for habitability is 35 degrees, beyond which humans begin simply dying from the heat. That leaves a gap of 8 degrees. What is called heat stress comes much sooner. Actually, we are there already. Since 1980, the planet has experienced a 50-fold increase in the number of dangerous heat waves. A bigger increase is to come. The five warmest summer in Europe since 1500 have all occurred since 2002. And eventually, the IPCC warns, simply working outdoors at the time of year will be unhealthy for parts of the globe. Even if we meet the Paris goals, cities like Karachi and Kolkata will annually encounter deadly heat waves like those that crippled them in 2015, when heat killed thousands in India and Pakistan. At 4 degrees, the deadly European heat wave of 2003, which killed as many as 2,000 people a day, will be a normal summer. Then it was one of the worst weather events in continental history, killing 35,000 Europeans, including 14,000 friends, perversely the infirm fared relatively well. William Langeweisel has written, most of them watched over in the nursing homes and hospitals of those well-off countries, and it was the comparatively healthy elderly who accounted for most of the dead, many left behind by vacationing families escaping the heat, with some corpses rotting for weeks before the families returned. It will get worse. In the business-as-usual scenario, a research team led by Ethan Kofel calculated in 2017 the number of days warmer than what were once the warmest days of the year could grow by a factor of 100 by 2080, possibly by a factor of 250. The metric Kofel uses is person days, a unit that combines the number of people affected with the number of days. Every year, there would be between 150 and 750 million person days with weight bulb temperatures equivalent to today's most severe, that is quite deadly, heat waves. 
there would be a million percent days each year with intolerable weight bulb temperatures, combinations of heat and humidity beyond the human capacity for survival. By the end of the century, the World Bank has estimated the coolest months in tropical South America, Africa, and Pacific are likely to be warmer than the warmest months at the end of the 20th century. We had heat waves back then, of course, deadly ones. In 1998, the Indian summer killed 2,500. More recently, temperature spikes have gotten hotter. In 2010, 55,000 died in a Russian heat wave that killed 700 people in Moscow each day. In 2016, in the midst of a heat wave that baked the Middle East for several months, temperatures in Iraq broke 100 degrees Fahrenheit in May, 110 in June, and 120 in July, with temperatures dipping below 100 most days only at night. In 2018, the hottest temperature likely ever recorded in April was registered in southeast Pakistan. In India, a single day over 95 degrees Fahrenheit increases annual mortality rates by three-quarters of a percent. In 2016, a string of days topped 120 in May. In Saudi Arabia, where summer temperatures often approach that mark, 700,000 barrels of oil are burned each day in the summer, mostly to power the nation's air conditioning. That can help with the heat, of course. But air conditioners and fans already account for fully 10% of global electricity consumption. Demand is expected to triple or perhaps quadruple by 2050. According to one estimate, the world will be adding 700 million AC units by just 2030. Another study suggests that by 2050, there will be around the world more than 9 billion cooling appliances of various kinds. But the climate-controlled malls of the Arab Emirates aside, it is not remotely economical, let alone green, to wholesale air condition all the hottest part of the planet, many of them also the poorest. And indeed, the crisis will be most dramatic across the Middle East and Persian Gulf, where in 2015, the heat index registered temperatures as high as 163 degrees Fahrenheit. As soon as several decades from now, the Hajj will become physically impossible for many of the 2 million Muslims who currently make the pilgrimage each year. It is not just the Hajj, and it is not just Mecca. In the sugarcane region of El Salvador, as much as one-fifth of the population, including over a quarter of the men, has chronic kidney disease, the presumed result of dehydration from working the fields they were able to comfortably harvest as recently as two decades ago. With dialysis, which is expensive, those with kidney failure can expect to live five years. Without it, life expectancy is measured in weeks. Of course, heat stress promises to asylum us in places other than our kidneys too. As I typed that sentence, in the California desert in mid-June, it is 121 degrees outside my door. It is not a record high. This is among the things cosmologists mean when they talk about the utter improbability of anything as advanced as human intelligence evolving anywhere in a universe as inhospitable to life as this one. Every uninhabitable planet out there is a reminder of just how unique a set of circumstances is required to produce a climate equilibrium supportive of life. No intelligent life that we know of ever evolved anywhere in the universe outside of the narrow Goldilocks range of temperatures that enclosed all of human evolution and that we have now left behind probably permanently. How much hotter will it get? The question may sound scientific, inviting expertise, but the answer is almost entirely human, which is to say political. The menace of climate change is a mercurial one. Uncertainty makes it a safe shifting threat. When will the planet warm by 2 degrees and when by 3? How much sea level rise will be there by 2030, by 2050 and by 2100? As our children are leaving the earth to their children and grandchildren, which cities will flood, which forests will dry out, which bread baskets will become husk? That uncertainty is among the most momentous meta-narratives that climate change will bring to our culture over the next decades.
an eerie lack of clarity about what the world we live in will even look like just a decade or two down the road when we will still be living in the same homes and paying the same mortgages watching the same television shows and making appeals to many of the same justices of the supreme court but while there are few things science does not know about how the climate system will respond to all the carbon we have pumped into the air the uncertainty of what will happen that haunting uncertainty emerges not from scientific ignorance but overwhelmingly from the open question of how we respond that is principally how much more carbon we decide to emit which is not a question for the natural sciences but the human ones climatologists can today predict with uncanny accuracy where a hurricane will hit and what intensity as much as a week out from landfall this is not just because the models are good but because all the inputs are known when it comes to global warming the models are just as good but the key input is a mystery what will we do the lessons are unfortunately bleak three quarters of a century since global warming was first recognized as a problem we have made no meaningful adjustment to our production or consumption of energy to account for it and protect ourselves for far too long casual climate observers have watched scientists draw pathways to a stable climate and concluded that the world would adopt accordingly instead the world has done more or less nothing as though those pathways would implement themselves market forces have delivered cheaper and more widely available green energy but the same market forces have absorbed those innovations which is to say profited from them while continuing to grow emissions politics has produced gestures of tremendous global solidarity and cooperation then discarded those promises immediately it has become commonplace among climate activists to say that we have today all the tools we need to avoid catastrophic climate change even major climate change it is also true but political will is not same tribal ingredients always at hand we have the tools we need to solve global poverty epidemic disease and abuse of women as well it was as recent as 2016 that the celebrated paris climate accords were adopted defining 2 degrees of global warming as a must meet target and rallying all the world's nations to meet it and the returns are already dispiritingly grim in 2017 carbon emissions grew by 1.4% according to the international energy agency after an ambiguous couple of years optimists had hoped represented a leveling off or peak instead we are climbing again even before the new spike not a single major industrial nation was on track to fulfill the commitments it made in the paris treaty of course those commitments only get us down to 3.2 degrees to keep the planet under 2 degrees of warming all signatory nations have to significantly better their places at present there are 195 signatories of which only the following are considered even in range of their paris targets morocco gambia bhutan costa rica Ethiopia, India, and the Philippines. This puts Donald Trump's commitment to withdraw from the treaty in a useful perspective. In fact, his spite may ultimately prove perversely productive, since the evacuation of American leadership on climate seems to have mobilized China, giving Xi Jinping an opportunity and enticement to adopt a much more aggressive posture towards climate. Of course, those renewed Chinese commitments are at this point just rhetorical too. The country already has the world's largest footprint, and in the first three months of 2018, its emissions grew by 4%. China commands half of the planet's coal power capacity, which plants that only operate on average half of the time, which means their use could quickly grow. Globally, coal power has nearly doubled since 2000. According to one analysis, if the world as a whole followed the Chinese example, it would bring 5 degrees of warming by 2100. In 2018, the United Nations predicted that at the current emissions rate, the world would pass 1.5 degrees by 2040, if not sooner. According to the 2017 National Climate Assessment, even if global carbon concentration was immediately stabilized, we should expect more than half a degree celsius of additional warming to come which is why staying below 2 degrees probably requires not just carbon scale back 
but what are called negative emissions. These tools come in two forms. Technologies that would suck carbon out of the air, called CCS for carbon capture and storage, and new approaches to forestry and agriculture that would do the same in a slightly more old-fashioned way, that is bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECCS. According to a raft of recent papers, both are something close to fantasy, at least at present. In 2018, the European Academy Science Advisory Council found that existing negative emissions technologies have limited realistic potential to even slow the increase in concentration of carbon in the atmosphere, let alone meaningfully reduce the concentration. In 2018, Nature dismissed all scenarios built on CCS as magical thinking. It is not even so pleasant to engage in that thinking. There is not much carbon in the air, all told. Just 410 parts per million, but it is everywhere. And so relying on carbon capture globally could require large-scale scrubbing plantations nearly everywhere on Earth. The planet transformed into something like an air recycling plant orbiting the sun an industrial satellite tracing a parabola through the solar system. This is not what Barbara Ward or Buckminster Fuller meant by spaceship Earth. And while advances are sure to come, bringing costs down and making more efficient machines, we can't wait much longer for that progress. We simply don't have the time. One estimate suggests that to have hope of two degrees, we need to open fully-scale carbon capture plants at the pace of one and a half per day every day for the next 70 years. In 2018, the world has 18 of them in total. This is not good, but indifference is unfortunately nothing new when it comes to climate. Projecting future warming is a foolish game, given how many layers of uncertainty govern the outcome. But if a best case scenario is now somewhere between 2 and 2.5 degrees of warming by 2100, it seems that the likeliest outcome, the fattest part of the belly curve of probability, sits at about 3 degrees, or just a bit above. Probably, even that amount of warming would require significant negative emissions use, given that our use of carbon is still growing. And there is also some risk from scientific uncertainty. The possibility that we are underestimating the effects of those feedback loops in natural systems we only poorly understand. Conceivably, if those processes are triggered, we could hit 4 degrees of warming by 2100, even with a meaningful reduction in emissions over the coming decades. But the track record since Kyoto implies that human short-sightedness makes it unproductive to offer predictions about what will happen when it comes to emissions and warming. Better to consider what could happen. The sky is literally the limit. Cities where the world will overwhelmingly live in the near future only magnify the problem of high temperature. Asphalt and concrete and everything else that makes a city dense, including human flesh, absorb ambient heat, essentially storing it for a time, like a slow-release poison pill. This is especially problematic because in a heat wave, nightly reprieves are vital, allowing bodies to recover. When those reprieves are shorter and shallower, flesh simply continues to simmer. In fact, the concrete and asphalt of cities absorb so much heat during the day that when it is released at night, it can raise the local temperature as much as 22 degrees Fahrenheit, turning what could be bearably hot days into deadly ones. As in the Chicago heat wave of 1995, which killed 739 people, the direct heat effects compounded by broken public health infrastructure. That commonly cited figure only reflects immediate deaths of the many thousands more who visited hospitals during the heat wave. Almost half died within the year. Others merely suffered permanent brain damage. Scientists call this the heat island effect. Each city, its own enclosed space, and hotter the more crowded it is. Of course, the world is rapidly urbanizing, with the United Nations estimating that two-thirds of the global population will live in cities by 2050, 2.5 billion new urbanites by that count. For a century or more, the city has seemed like a vision of the future to much of the world, which keeps inventing new scales of metropolis. Bigger than 5 million people, bigger than 10, bigger than 20. Climate change won't likely slow that pattern by much, but it will make the great migrations it reflects more perilous with many millions of the world's ambitious flooding into cities whose calendars are dotted 
with days of deadly heat gathering in those new megalopolises like moths to a flame. In theory, climate change could even reverse those migrations, perhaps more totally than crime did in many American cities in the last century, turning urban populations in certain parts of the world outward as the cities themselves become unbearable. In the heat, roads in cities will melt and train tracks will buckle. This is actually happening already, but the impacts will mushroom in the decades ahead. Currently, there are 354 major cities with average maximum summertime temperatures of 95 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. By 2050, that list could grow to 970, and the number of people living in those cities and exposed to that deadly heat could grow eightfold to 1.6 billion. In the United States alone, 70,000 workers have been seriously injured by heat since 1992, and by 2050, 255,000 are expected to die globally from direct heat effects. Already, as many as 1 billion are at risk for heat stress worldwide, and a third of the world's population is subject to deadly heat waves at least 20 days each year. By 2100, that third will grow to half, even if we manage to pull up short of 2 degrees. If we don't, the number could climb to 3 quarters. In the United States, heat stroke has a pathetic reputation, a plague you learn about from summer camp like swimming cramps. But heat death is among the cruelest punishments to a human body, just as painful and disorienting as hypothermia. First comes heat exhaustion, mostly a mark of dehydration, profuse sweating, nausea, headache. After a certain point though, water won't help. Your core temperature rising as your body sends blood outward to the skin, hoping desperately to cool it down. The skin often reddens. Internal organs begin to fail. Eventually, you could stop sweating. The brain, too, stops working properly. And sometimes, after a period of agitation and combativeness, the episode is punctuated with a lethal heart attack. When it comes to extreme heat, Langerweiser has written, you can no more escape the conditions than you can save your skin. Hunger Climates differ and plants vary. But the basic rule of thumb for staple cereal crops grown at optimal temperature is that for every degree of warming, yields decline by 10%. Some estimates run higher, which means that if the planet is 5 degrees warmer at the end of the century, when projections suggest we may have as many as 50% more people to feed. We may also have 50% less grain to give them. Or even less. Because yields actually decline faster the warmer things get. And proteins are worse. It takes 8 pounds of grain to produce just a single pound of hamburger meat. Butchered from a cow that spent its life warming the planet with meat and birds. Globally, grain accounts for about 40% of the human diet. When you add soybeans and corn, you get up to two-thirds of all human calories. Overall, the United Nations estimates that the planet will need nearly twice as much food in 2050 as it does today. And although it is a speculative figure, it's not a bad one. Polyanis plant physiologist will point out that the cereal crop mat applies only to those regions already at peak growing temperature. And they are right, theoretically. A warmer climate will make it easier to grow wheat in Greenland. But as a path-breaking paper by Rosamund Naylor and David Bassetti pointed out, the tropics are already too hot to efficiently grow grain, and those places where grain is produced today are already at optimal growing temperature, which means even a small warming will push them down a slope of declining productivity. The same, broadly speaking, is true for corn. At 4 degrees of warming, corn yields in the United States, the world's top producer of maize, are expected to drop by almost half. Predicted declines are not quite as dramatic in the next three biggest producers, China, Argentina, Brazil. But in each case, the country would lose at least a fifth of its productivity. A decade ago, climatologists might have told you that although direct heat undermined plant growth, the extra carbon in the atmosphere would have the opposite effect, a kind of airborne fertilizer. The effect is strongest on weeds, though and does not seem to hold for grain. 
and at higher concentrations of carbon, plants grow thicker leaves, which sounds innocuous, but thicker leaves are worse at absorbing CO2, an effect that means by the end of the century as much as 6.39 billion additional tons in the atmosphere each year. Beyond carbon, climate change means staple crops are doing battle with more insects. Their increased activity could cut yields an additional 2 to 4 percent as well as fungus and disease, not to mention flooding. Some crops, like sorghum, are a bit more robust. But even in those regions where such alternatives have been a staple, their production has diminished recently. And while grain breeders have some hope that they can produce more heat-tolerant strains, they have been trying for decades without success. The world's natural wheat belt is moving poleward by about 160 miles each decade. But you can't easily move croplands north a few hundred miles. And not just because it's difficult to suddenly clear the land occupied now by towns, highways, office parks and industrial installations. Ills in places like remote areas of Canada and Russia, even if they warmed by a few degrees, would be limited by the quality of soil there since it takes many centuries for the planet to produce optimally fertile dirt. The lands that are fertile are the ones we are already using, and the climate is changing much too fast to wait for the northern soil to catch up. That soil, believe it or not, is literally disappearing. 75 billion tons of soil lost each year. In the United States, the rate of erosion is 10 times as high as the natural replenishment rate. In China and India, it is 30 to 40 times as fast. Even when we try to adapt, we move too slowly. Economist Richard Hornbeck specializes in the history of the American Dust Bowl. He says that farmers of that era could conceivably have adapted to the changing climate of their time by cultivating different crops. But they didn't, lacking credit to make the necessary investment, and were therefore unable to seek inertia and ritual and the rootedness of identity. So instead of crops died out in cascading waves crashing through whole American states and all the people living in them. As it happens, a similar transformation is unfolding in the American West right now. In 1879, the naturalist John Wesley Powell, who spent his downtime as a soldier during the Battle of Vicksburg studying the rocks that filled the Union trenches, divined a natural boundary running due north along the 100th meridian. It separated the humid and therefore cultivatable natural farmland of what became the Midwest from the arid, spectacular but less farmable land of the true West. The divide ran through Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas, and stretches south into Mexico and north into Manitoba, Canada, separating more densely populated communities full of large farms from sparser, open land that was never truly made valuable by agriculture. Since just 1980, that boundary has moved fully 140 miles east, almost to the 98th parallel, drying up hundreds of thousands of square miles of farmland in the process. The planet's only other similar boundary is the one separating the Sahara Desert from the rest of Africa. That desert has expanded by 10% too. In the winter, the figure is 18%. The privileged children of the industrialized West have long laughed at the predictions of Thomas Malthus, the British economist who believed that long-term economic growth was impossible since its bumper crop or episode of growth would ultimately produce more children to consume or absorb it. And as a result, the size of any population, including that of the planet as a whole, was a check against material well-being. In 1968, Paul Ehrlich made a similar warning, updated for a 21st century planet with many times more people on it, with his widely derided The Population Bomb, which proposed that the economic and agricultural productivity of the Earth had already reached its natural limit, and which was published as it happened, just as the productivity gains from what's called the Green Revolution were coming into focus. The term which today is sometimes used to describe advances in clean energy 
first arrows to name the incredible boom in agricultural yields produced by innovations in farming practices in the middle of the 20th century. In the half century since, not only has the world's population doubled, but the fraction of people living in extreme poverty has fallen by a factor of about 6, from just more than half of humanity to 10%. In the world's developing countries, undernourishment has dropped from more than 30% in 1970 to close to 10% today. These developments counsel sanguinity in the face of all kinds of environmental pressures. And in his recent book on the meaning of the 20th century agricultural boom, the writer Charles Mann divides those who respond to the seeming challenge of resource scarcity with reflexive optimism, whom he calls wizards, from those who see collapse always around the corner, whom he calls prophets. But though the Green Revolution seems almost too perfectly conceived and executed to refute Ehrlich's alarmism, Mann himself is not sure what the lessons are. It may be a bit early to judge Ehrlich, or perhaps even his godfather, Malthus, since nearly all of the astonishing productivity gains of the last century trace back to the work of a single man. Norman Borlaug, perhaps, the best argument for the humanitarian virtue of America's imperial century. Born to Iowa family farmers in 1914, he went to state school, found work at DuPont, and then, with the help of the Rockefeller Foundation, developed a new collection of high-yield, disease-resistant wheat varieties that are now credited with saving the lives of a billion people worldwide. Of course, if those grains were a one-time boost, engineered in large part by a single man, how comfortably can we count on future improvements? The academic term for the subject of this debate is carrying capacity. How much population can a given environment ultimately support before collapsing or degrading from overuse? But it is one thing to consider what might be the maximum yield of a particular plot of earth, and another to contemplate how fully that number is governed by environmental systems, far larger and more diffusely determined than even an imperial wizard like Borlaug could reasonably expect to command and control. Global warming, in other words, is more than just one input in an equation to determine carrying capacity. It is the set of conditions under which all of our experiments to improve that capacity will be conducted. In this way, Climate change appears to be not merely one challenge among many facing a planet already struggling with civil strife and war and horrifying inequality and far too many other insoluble hardships to iterate, but the all-encompassing stage on which all those challenges will be met. A whole spare, in other words, which literally contains within it all of the world's future problems and all of its possible solutions. Curiously, maddeningly, this can be the same. The graphs that show so much recent progress in the developing world on poverty, on hunger, on education, and infant mortality, and life expectancy, and gender relations, and more, are practically speaking the same graphs that trace the dramatic rise in global carbon emissions that has brought the planet to the brink of overall catastrophe. This is one aspect of what is meant by the term climate justice. Not only is it undeniably the case that the cruelest impacts of climate change will be borne by those least resilient in the face of climate tragedy, but to a large degree what could be called the humanitarian growth of the developing world's middle class since the end of the Cold War has been paid for by fossil fuel driven industrialism and investment in the well-being of the global south made by mortgaging the ecological future of the planet. This is one reason that our global climate fate will be saved so overwhelmingly by the development patterns of China and India, who have the tragic burden of trying to bring many hundreds of millions more into the global middle class, while knowing that the easy paths taken by the nations that industrialized in the 19th and even 20th centuries are now paths to climate chaos. Which is not to say they won't follow them anyway. By 2050, milk consumption in China is expected to grow to triple the current level, thanks to the changing, waste-facing taste of its emerging consumer classes, a single-item boom in a single country that is expected, all by itself 
to increase global greenhouse gas emissions from dairy farming by about 35%. Already, global food production accounts for about a third of all emissions. To avoid dangerous climate change, Greenpeace has estimated that the world needs to cut its meat and dairy consumption in half by 2050. Everything we know about what happens when countries get wealthier suggests this will be close to impossible. And turning away from milk is one thing. Turning down cheap electrification, automobile culture, or the protein-heavy diets the world's healthy rely on to stay thin are much bigger asks. In the post-industrial West, we try not to think about these bargains, which have benefited us so enormously. When we do, it is often in the guilt spirit of what critic Chris Barkus has memorably called the Malthusian tragic, namely our inability to see any remaining innocence in the quotidian life of the well-to-do West given the devastation that wealth has imposed on the world of natural wonder it conquered and the suffering of those elsewhere on the planet left behind in the race to endless material comforts and asked functionally to pay for them. Of course, most have not embraced the tragic or self-pitying view. A state of half-ignorance and half-indifference is a much more pervasive climate sickness than true denial or true fatalism. It is the subject of William Fullman's grand two-part carbon ideologies, which opens beyond the epigraph a crime is something someone else commits. From Steinbeck like this, someday, perhaps not long from now, the inhabitants of a hotter, more dangerous and biologically diminished planet than the one on which I lived may wonder what you and I were thinking, or whether we thought at all. For much of the book's prologue, he writes in a past tense rendered from an imagined devastated future. Of course, we did it to ourselves. We had always been intellectually lazy, and the less asked of us, the less we had to say. He writes, We all lived for money, and that is what we die for. Drought may be an even bigger problem for food production than heat, with some of the world's most arable land turning quickly to desert. At 2 degrees of warming, droughts will wallop the Mediterranean and much of India, and corn and sorghum all around the world will suffer straining global food supply. At 2.5 degrees, thanks mostly to drought, the world could enter a global food deficit, needing more calories than the planet can produce. At 3 degrees, there would be further drought in Central America, Pakistan, the Western United States, and Australia. At 5 degrees, the whole earth would be wrapped in what the environmentalist Mark Linus calls two globe girdling belts of perennial drought. Precipitation is notoriously hard to model in detail, yet predictions for later this century are basically unanimous. Both unprecedented droughts and unprecedented flood producing rains. By 2080, without dramatic reductions in emissions, southern Europe will be in permanent extreme drought, much worse than the American dust bowl ever was. The same will be true in Iraq and Syria, and most of the rest of the Middle East. Some of the most densely populated parts of Australia, Africa, and South America, and the breadbasket regions of China. None of these places which today supply much of the world's food would be reliable sources going forward. As for the original dust bowl, the droughts in the American plains and southwest would not just be worse than in the 1930s, a 2015 NASA study predicted, but worse than any drought in a thousand years, and that includes those that struck between 1100 and 1300, which dried up all the rivers east of the Sierra Nevada mountains and may have been responsible for the death of the Anasazi civilization. Remember, even with the remarkable gains of the last decades, we do not presently live in a world without hunger. Far from it, most estimates put the number of undernourished at 800 million globally, with as many as 100 million hungry because of climate shocks. What is called hidden hunger, micronutrient and dietary deficiencies is considerably high, affecting well over 1 billion people. The spring of 2017 brought an unprecedented quadruple famine to Africa and the Middle East, 
the United Nations warned that those separate starvation events in Somalia, South Sudan, Nigeria, and Yemen could kill 20 million that year. That was a single year in a single region. Africa is today straining to feed about 1 billion people, a population expected to quadruple over the course of the 21st century to 4 billion. One hopes these population booms will bring their own burlocks, ideally many of them, and already there are some hints of possible technological breakthroughs. China has invested in truly customized farming strategies to boost productivity and cut the use of greenhouse gas producing fertilizer. In Britain, a soil free startup announced its first harvest in 2018. In the United States, you already hear about the prospects for vertical farming, which saves farmland by stacking crops indoors and lab grown protein which does the same by culturing meats inside test tubes. But these remain vanguard technologies, distributed unequally and being so expensive, unavailable for now to the many who are most in need. A decade ago, there was great optimism that GMO crops could produce another green revolution. But today, gene modification has been used mostly to make plants more resistant to pesticides. Pesticides manufactured and sold by the same companies engineering the crops. And cultural resistance has grown so rapidly that Whole Foods now advertises its house brand of seltzer as GMO free sparkling water. It is far from clear how much benefit even those able to take advantage of vanguard techniques will be able to reap. Over the past 15 years, the iconoclastic mathematicians Irakli Lolatsa has isolated a dramatic effect of carbon dioxide on human nutrition. Unanticipated by plant physiologists, it can make plants bigger, but those bigger plants are less nutritious. Every leaf and every grass blade on earth makes more and more sugars as CO2 levels keep rising. Lolatze told Politico in a story about his work headlined The Great Nutrient Collapse. We are witnessing the greatest injection of carbohydrates into the biosphere in human history, an injection that dilutes other nutrients in our food supply. Since 1950, most of the food stuff in the plant we grow, protein, calcium, iron, vitamin C, to name just four, has declined by as much as one third a landmark 2004 study showed. Everything is becoming more like junk food. Even the protein content of bee pollen has dropped by a third. The problem has gotten worse, as carbon concentrations have gotten worse. Recently, researchers estimated that by 2050, as many as 150 million people in the developing world will be at risk of protein deficiency as the result of nutrient collapse. Since so many of the world's poor depend on crops rather than animal meat for protein, 138 million could suffer from a deficiency of zinc, essential to healthy pregnancies, and 1.4 billion could face a dramatic decline in dietary iron, pointing to a possible epidemic of anemia. In 2018, a team led by Chun Wo Cho looked at the protein content of 18 different strains of rice, the staple crop for more than 2 billion people, and found that more carbon dioxide in the air produced nutritional declines across the board, drops in protein content as well as in iron, zinc, and vitamins B1, B2, B5, and B9. Really everything but vitamin E. Overall, the researchers found that acting just through that single crop, rice, carbon emissions could imperil the health of 600 million people. In previous centuries, empires were built on that crop. Climate change promises another, an empire of hunger, erected among the world's poor. Drowning That the sea will become a killer is a given. Barring a reduction of emissions, we could see at least 4 feet of sea level rise and possibly 8 by the end of the century. A radical reduction of the scale that could make the Paris 2 degree goal a conceivably attainable, if quite optimistic target, could still produce as much as 2 meters or 6 feet by 2100. Perversely, for a generation now, we have been comforted by numbers like this. When we think the worst that climate change can bring is an ocean a few feet higher, 
Anyone who lives even a short distance from the coast feels like they can breathe easy. In that way, even alarmist popular writing about global warming has been a victim of its own success. So focused on sea level rise that it has blinded readers to all the climate causes beyond the oceans that threaten to terrorize the coming generations. Direct heat, extreme weather, pandemic disease, and more. But as familiar as sea level rise may seem, it surely deserves its place at the center of the picture of what damage climate change will bring. That so many feel already acclimated to the prospect of a near future world with dramatically high oceans should be as dispiriting and disconcerting as if we had already come to accept the inevitability of extended nuclear war because that is the scale of devastation the rising oceans will unleash. In the water will come, Jeff Goodell runs through just a few of the monuments, indeed, in some cases, whole cultures that will be transformed into underwater relics, like sunken ships, this century, any beach you have ever visited, Facebook's headquarters, the Kennedy Space Center, and the United States' largest naval base in Norfolk, Virginia, the entire nations of the Maldives and the Marshall Islands. Most of Bangladesh, including all of the mangrove forests that have been the kingdom of Bengal tigers for millennia, all of Miami Beach and much of the South Florida paradise engineered out of Mars, and swamp and sandbar by rabid real estate spectaculars less than a century ago. St. Mark's Basilia in Venice, today nearly a thousand years old, Venice Beach and Santa Monica in Los Angeles the White House at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, as well as Trump's Winter White House at Mar-a-Lago, Richard Nixon's in Key Biscayne, and the original Harry Truman's in Key West. This is a very partial list. We have spent the millennia since Plato enamored with the story of a single drowned culture, Atlantis, which if it ever existed, was probably a small archipelago of Mediterranean islands, with a population numbering in the thousands, possibly tens of thousands. By 2100, if we do not halt emissions, as much as 5% of the world's population will be flooded every single year. Jakarta is one of the world's fastest growing cities, today home to 10 million. Thanks to flooding and literal sinking, it could be entirely underwater as soon as 2050. Already, China is evacuating hundreds of thousands every summer to keep them out of the range of flooding in the Pearl River Delta. What would be submerged by these floods are not just the homes of those who flee. Hundreds of millions of new climate refugees unleashed onto a world incapable. At this point of accommodating the needs of just a few million, but communities, schools, shopping districts, farmlands, office buildings, and high-rises, regional cultures so sprawling that just a few centuries ago, we might have remembered them as empires unto themselves. Now suddenly, underwater museums showcasing the way of life in the one or two centuries when humans, rather than keeping their safe distance, rushed to build up at the coastline. It will take thousands of years, perhaps millions for quads and fails par to degrade into sand that might replace the beaches we lose. Much of the infrastructure of the internet, one study showed, could be drowned by sea level rise in less than two decades. And most of the smartphones we use to navigate it are today manufactured in Shenzhen, which, sitting right in the Pearl River Delta, is likely to be flooded soon as well. In 2018, the Union of Concerned Scientists found that nearly 311,000 homes in the United States would be at risk of chronic inundation by 2045, a time span, as they pointed out, no longer than a mortgage. By 2100, the number would be more than 2.4 million properties, or $1 trillion worth of American real estate underwater. Climate change may not only make the miles along the American coast uninsurable, it could render obsolete the very idea of disaster insurance by the end of the century, one recent study showed. Certain places could be stuck by six different climate-driven disasters simultaneously. If no significant action is taken to curb emissions, 
one estimate of global damages is as high as $100 trillion per year by 2100. That is more than global GDP today. Most estimates are a bit lower, $14 trillion a year, still almost a fifth of present-day GDP. But the flooding would not stop at the end of the century, since sea level rise would continue for millennia, ultimately producing, in even that optimistic 2 degree scenario, oceans 6 meters higher. What would that look like? The planet would lose about 444,000 square miles of land, where about 375 million people live today, a quarter of them in China. In fact, the 20 cities most affected by such sea level rise are all Asian megalopolis, among them Shanghai, Hong Kong, Mumbai, and Kolkata. Which does cast a climate shroud over the prospect, now so much taken for granted among the Nostradamuses of geopolitics of an Asian century? Whatever the course of climate change, China will surely continue its ascent, but it will do so while fighting back the ocean. As well, perhaps one reason it is already so focused on establishing control over the South China Sea. Nearly two-thirds of the world's major cities are on the coast, not to mention its power plants, ports, navy bases, farmlands, fisheries, river deltas, marshlands, and rice paddies. And even those above 10 feet will float much more easily and much more regularly if the water gets that high. Already, flooding has quadrupled since 1980, according to the European Academy's Science Advisory Council, and doubled since just 2004. Even under an intermediate low sea level rise scenario, by 2100, high tide flooding could hit the east coast of the United States every other day. We haven't even gotten to inland flooding when rivers run over, swollen by deluges of rain or storm surges channeled downstream from the sea. Between 1995 and 2015, this affected 2.3 billion and killed 157,000 around the world. Under even the most radically aggressive global emissions reduction regime, the further warming of the planet from just the carbon we have already pumped into the atmosphere would increase global rainfall to such a degree that the number affected by river flooding in South America would double, according to one paper, from 6 million to 12 million. In Africa, it would grow from 24 to 35 million and in Asia, from 70 to 156 million. All told, at just 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming, food damage would increase by between 160 and 240 percent. At 2 degrees, the death toll from flooding would be 50 percent higher than today. In the United States, one recent model suggested that FEMA's recent projection of flood risk were off by a factor of 3 and that more than 40 million Americans were at the risk of catastrophic inundation. These effects will come to pass even with a radical reduction of emissions. Keep in mind, without flood adaption measures, large swathes of northern Europe and the whole eastern half of the United States will be affected by at least 10 times as many floods. In large parts of India, Bangladesh and Southeast Asia, where flooding is today catastrophically common, the multiplier could be just as high, and the baseline is already so elevated that it annually produces humanitarian crisis on a scale we like to think we would not forget for generations. Instead, we forget them immediately. In 2017, floods in South Asia killed 1,200 people, leaving two-thirds of Bangladesh underwater. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, estimated that 41 million people had been affected. As with so much climate change data, those numbers can numb, but 41 million is as much as eight times the entire global population at the time of the Black Sea deluge 7,600 years ago, reputedly so dramatic and catastrophic a flood that it may have given rise to our Noah's Ark story. At the same time as the floods hit in 2017, almost 700,000 Rohingya refugees from Myanmar arrived in Bangladesh, most of them in a single settlement site that became more populous than Lyon, France's third biggest city, and was erected in the part of landslides, just as the next monsoon season arrived. 
to what degree we will be able to adapt to new coastlines is primarily a matter of just how fast the water rises. Our understanding of that timeline has been evolving disconcertingly fast. When the Paris Agreement was drafted, those writing it were sure that the Antarctic ice sheets, even as the planet warmed several degrees, their expectation was that oceans could rise, at most, only three feet by the end of the century. That was just in 2015. The same year, NASA found that this expectation was hopelessly complacent, suggesting three feet was not a maximum, but in fact, a minimum. In 2017, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, suggested eight feet was possible, still, just in this century. On the East Coast, scientists have already introduced a new term, sunny day floating, when high tide alone, aided by no additional rainstorm, inundates a town. In 2018, a major study found things accelerating faster still, with the melt rate of the Antarctic ice sheet tripling just in the past decade. From 1992 to 1997, the sheet lost, on average, 49 billion tons of ice each year. From 2012 to 2017, it was 219 billion. In 2016, climate scientist James Hansen has suggested sea level could rise several meters over 50 years if ice melt doubled every decade. The new paper, keep in mind, registers a tripling and in the space of just five years. Since the 1950s, the continent has lost 13,000 square miles from its ice shelf. Experts say its ultimate fate will probably be determined by what human action is taken in just the next decade. All climate change is governed by uncertainty, mostly the uncertainty of human action. What action will be taken and when to avert or forestall the dramatic transformation of life on the planet that will unfold in the absence of dramatic intervention. Each of our projections, from the most blase to the most extreme, comes wrapped in doubt, the result of so many estimates and so many assumptions that it would be foolish to take any of them, so to speak, to the plan. But sea level rise is different because on top of the basic mystery of human response, it layers much more epistemological ignorance than governs any other aspect of climate change science, say perhaps the question of cloud formation. When water warms, it expands. This we know. But the breaking up of ice represents almost an entirely new physics, never before observed in human history, and therefore only poorly understood. There are now, thanks to rapid arctic melt, papers devoted to what are called the damage mechanics of ice shelf loss, but we do not yet well understand those dynamics, which will be one of the main drivers of sea level rise, and so cannot yet make confident predictions about how quickly ice sheets will melt. And even though we now have a decent picture of the planet's climatological past, never in the Earth's entire recorded history has there been warming at anything like this speed, by one estimate around 10 times faster than at any point in the last 66 million years. Every year, the average American emits enough carbon to melt 10,000 tons of ice in the Antarctic ice sheets, enough to add 10,000 cubic meters of water to the ocean. Every minute, each of us adds 5 gallons. One study suggests that the Greenland ice sheet could reach a tipping point at just 1.2 degrees of global warming. We are nearing that temperature level today, already at 1.1 degrees. Melting that ice sheet alone would, over centuries, raise sea levels 6 meters, eventually drowning Miami and Manhattan, and London and Shanghai and Bangkok and Mumbai. And while business as usual emissions trajectories warm the planet by just over 4 degrees by 2100, because temperature changes are unevenly distributed around the planet, they threaten to warm the Arctic by 13. In 2014, we learned that the West Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets were even more vulnerable to melting than scientists anticipated. In fact, the West Antarctic sheet had already passed a tipping point of collapse, more than doubling its rate of ice loss in just five years. The same had happened in Greenland, where the ice sheet is now losing almost a billion tons of ice every single day. 
The two seats contain enough ice to raise global sea levels 10 to 20 feet each. In 2017, it was revealed that two glaciers in the East Antarctic Sea were also losing ice at an alarming rate. 18 billion tons of ice each year, enough to cover New Jersey in three feet of ice. If both glaciers go, scientists expect, ultimately, an additional 16 feet of water. In total, the two Antarctic ice sheets could raise sea level by 200 feet. In many parts of the world, the shoreline would move by many miles. The last time the earth was 4 degrees warmer, as Peter Brennan has written, there was no ice at either pole and sea level was 260 feet higher. There were palm trees in the Arctic. Better not to think what that means for the life at the equator. As with all else in climate, the melting of the planet's ice will not occur in a vacuum and scientists do not yet fully understand exactly what cascading effects such as collapses will trigger. One major concern is methane, particularly the methane that might be released by a melting Arctic, where permafrost contains up to 1.8 trillion tons of carbon, considerably more than is currently suspended in the Earth's atmosphere. When it thaws, some of it will evaporate as methane, which is depending on how you measure at least several dozen times more powerful a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. When I first began seriously researching climate change, the risk from a sudden release of methane from the Arctic permafrost was considered quite low. In fact, so low that most scientists derided casual discussion of it as reckless, fear-mongering, and deployed mockingly hyperbolic terms like Arctic methane time bomb and burps of death to describe what they saw as climate risk not much worth worrying about in the near terms. The news since has not been encouraging. One nature paper found that the release of Arctic methane for permafrost lakes could be rapidly accelerated by burst of what is called abrupt thawing already underway. Atmospheric methane levels have risen dramatically in recent years. Confusing scientists unsure of their source, new research suggests the amount of gas being released by Arctic lakes could possibly double going forward. It's not clear whether this methane release is new or just that we finally begin to pay attention to it. But while the consensus is still that rapid, sudden release of methane is unlikely. The new research is a case study in why it is worthwhile to consider and take seriously such unlikely but possibly climate risk. When you define anything outside a narrow band of likelihood as irresponsible to consider or talk about or plan for, even unspectacular new research findings can catch you flat-footed. Today, all do agree that the permafrost is melting. The permafrost line having retreated 80 miles north in Canada over the last 50 years. The most recent IPCC assessment projects, a loss of near-surface permafrost of between 37 and 81% by 2100, though most scientists still believe that carbon will be released slowly, and mostly as less terrifying carbon dioxide. But as far as 2011, NOAA and the National Snow and Ice Data Center predicted that thawing permafrost would flip the whole region from being what is called a carbon sink, which absorbs atmospheric carbon to a carbon source, which releases carbon as quickly as the 2020s. By 2100, the same study said the Arctic will have released 100 billion tons of carbon. That is the equivalent of half of all the carbon produced by humanity since industrialization began. Remember, that is the Arctic feedback loop that does not much concern many scientists in the near term. The one that concerns them more at present is what is called the Alvedo effect. Ice is white and so reflects sunlight back into space rather than absorbing it. The less ice, the more sunlight is absorbed as global warming. And total disappearance of that ice, Peter Wadams has estimated, could mean a massive warming equivalent to the entire last 25 years of global carbon emissions. The last 25 years of emissions, keep in mind, is about half of the total that humanity has ever produced. The scale of carbon production that has pushed the planet from near complete climate stability to the brink of chaos. All of this is speculative, but our uncertainty over each of these dynamics, ice seed collapse, arctic methane, 
and albedo effect clouds our understanding only of the pace of change, not its scale. In fact, we do know what the end game for oceans look like, just not how long it will take us to get there. How much sea level rise is that? The ocean chemist David Archer is the researcher who has focused perhaps most acutely on what he calls the long throw impacts of global warming. It may take centuries, he says, even millennia, but he estimates that ultimately even at just 3 degrees of warming, sea level rise will be at least 50 meters, that is fully 100 times higher than Paris predicted for 2100. The US Geological Survey puts the ultimate figure at 80 meters or more than 260 feet. The world would perhaps not be made literally unrecognizable by that flooding but the distinction is ultimately semantic. Montreal would be almost entirely underwater, as would London. The United States is an unexceptional example. At just 170 feet, more than 97% of Florida would disappear, leaving only a few hills in the panhandle, and just under 97% of Delaware would submerged. Oceans would cover 80% of Louisiana, 70% of New Jersey, and half of South Carolina, Rhode Island, and Maryland. San Francisco and Sacramento would be underwater, as would New York City, Philadelphia, Providence, Houston, Seattle, and Virginia Beach, among dozens of other cities. In many places, the coast would retreat by as much as 100 miles. Arkansas and Vermont, landlocked today, would become coastal. The rest of the world may fare even worse. Menas, the capital of the Brazilian Amazon, would not just be on the ocean front, but underneath its water, as would Buenos Aires and the biggest city in the landlocked Paraguay, Asuntien, now more than 500 miles inland. In Europe, in addition to London, Dublin would be underwater, as would Brussels, Amsterdam, Copenhagen and Stockholm, Riga and Helsinki and St. Petersburg. Istanbul would flood and the Black Sea and the Mediterranean would join. In Asia, you could forget the coastline cities of Doha and Dubai and Karachi and Kolkata and Mumbai, just to name a few, and would be able to trace the trail of underwater metropolises from what is now close to desert in Baghdad all the way to Beijing itself a hundred miles inland. That 260-foot rise is ultimately the ceiling, but it is a pretty good bet we will get there eventually. Greenhouse gases simply work on too long a time scale to avoid it. Though what kind of human civilization will be around to see that flooded planet is very much to be determined. Of course, the scariest variable is how quickly that flood will come. Perhaps it will be a thousand years, but perhaps much sooner. More than 600 million people live within 30 feet of sea level today. Wildfire. The time between Thanksgiving and Christmas is meant to be in Southern California, the start of rainy season, not in 2017. The Thomas Fire, the worst of those that ruled the region that fall, grew 50,000 acres in one day, eventually burning 440 square miles and forcing the evacuation of more than 100,000 Californians. A week after it was sparked, it reminded, in the ominous semi-clinical language of wildfires, merely 15% contained. For a poetic approximation, it was not a bad estimate of how much of a handle we have on the forces of climate change that unleashed the Thomas fire and the many other environmental calamities for which it was an apocalyptic harbinger. This is to say, hardly any. The city burning is Los Angeles' deepest image of itself. John Didion wrote in Los Angeles Notebook, collected in Slouching Towards Bethlehem, published in 1968. But the cultural impression is apparently not that deep since the fires that broke out in the fall of 2017 produced, in headlines and on television and via text messages, astronized refrain of the adjectives unthinkable, unprecedented and unimaginable. Didion was writing about the fires that had swept through Malibu in 1956, Bel Air in 1961, Santa Barbara in 1964, and Watts in 1965. She updated her list 
in 1989 with fire season in which she described the fires of 1968, 1970, 1975, 1978, 1979, 1980, and 1982. Since 1919, when the county began keeping records of its fires, some areas have burned eight times. The list of deaths cautions, on the one hand, against wildfire alarmism, against a sort of cartoonishly Californian environmental panic, in which all observers are all consumed by the present instance of disaster. But all fires are not equal. Five of the 20 worst fires in California history hit the state in the fall of 2017, a year in which over 9,000 separate ones broke out, burning through more than 1.2 million acres, nearly 2,000 square miles, made suit. That October, in Northern California, 172 fires broke out in just two days. Devastation so cruel and sweeping that two different accounts were published in two different local newspapers of two different aging couples taking desperate cover in pools as the fires swallowed their homes. One couple survived, emerging after six excruciating hours to find their home transformed into an ass monument. In the other account, it was only the husband who emerged, his wife of 55 years having died in his arms. As Americans traded horror stories in the aftermath of those fires, they could be forgiven for mixing up the stories or being confused that climate terror could be so general as to provide variation on such a theme had seemed, as recently as that September, impossible to believe. The following year offered another variation. In the summer of 2018, the fires were fewer in number, totaling only 6,000. But just one that made of a whole network of fires together called Mendocino Complex burned almost half a million acres alone. In total, more than 2,000 square miles in the state burned to flame and smoke blanketed almost half the country. Things were worse to the north in British Columbia where more than 3 million acres burned, producing smoke that would, if followed the pattern of previous Canadian plumes, travel across the Atlantic to Europe. Then in November came the Woosley Fire, which forced the evacuation of 170,000 and the campfire, which was somehow worse, burning through more than 200 square miles and incinerating an entire town so quickly that the evacuees, 50,000 of them, found themselves sprinting past exploding cars, their sneakers melting to the asphalt as they ran. It was the deadliest fire in California history, a record that had been set almost a century before by the Griffin Park Fire of 1933. If these wildfires were not unprecedented in California at least, what did we mean when we called them that? Like September 11, which followed several decades of morbid American fantasies about the World Trade Center, this new class of terror looked to a horrified public like a climate prophecy, made in fear, now made real. That prophecy was threefold. First, the simple intuition of climate horrors and especially biblical premonition when the plague is out of control fire, like a dust storm of flame. Second, the expanding reach of wildfires in particular, which now can fill in much of the west only a gust of bad wind away. But perhaps the most harrowing of the ways in which the fires seem to confirm our cinematic nightmares was the third. That climate chaos could bridge our most imperious fortresses, that is our cities. With hurricanes Katrina, Sandy, Harvey, Irma, and Michael, Americans have gotten acquainted with the trade of flooding. But water is just the beginning. In the affluent cities of the West, even those conscious of environmental chains have spent the last few decades walking our street grids and driving our highways, navigating our superabundant supermarkets and all everywhere internet and believing that we had built our way out of nature. We have not. A paradise dreamscape erected in a barren desert. LA has always been an impossible city, as Mike Davis has so brilliantly written. The sight of flames straddling the 8-lane I-405 is a reminder that it is still impossible. In fact, getting more so. For a time, we have come to believe that civilization moved in the other direction, making the impossible first possible and then stable and routine. 
With climate change, we are moving instead toward nature and chaos into a new realm unbounded by the analogy of any human experience. Two big forces conspire to prevent us from normalizing fires like this, though neither is exactly a cause for celebration. The first is that extreme weather won't let us, since it won't stabilize, so that even within a decade, it's a fair bet that these fires which now occupy the nightmares of every Californian will be thought of as the old normal, the good old days. The second force is also contained in the story of the wildfires, the way that climate change is finally striking close to home, some quite special homes. The California fires of 2017 burned the state's wine crop, blowtorched million-dollar vacation properties, and threatened both the Getty Museum and Rupert Murdoch's Bel Air estate. There may not be two better symbols of the imperiousness of American money than those two structures. Nearby, the sunshiny children's fantasia of Disneyland was quickly canopied as the fires began to encroach by an eerily apocalyptic orange sky. On local golf courses, the West Coast wealthy still showed up for their tea times, swinging their clubs just yards from blazing fires in photographs that could not have been more perfectly staged to square the country's indifferent plutocracy. The following year, Americans watched the Kardashians evacuate via Instagram stories, then read about the private firefighting forces they employed. The rest of the state relied on conscripted convicts earning as little as a dollar a day. By accidents of geography and by the force of its wealth, the United States has, to this point, been mostly protected from the devastation climate change has already visited on parts of the less developed world, mostly. The fact that warming is now hitting our wealthiest citizens is not just an opportunity for an ugly burst of liberal schadenfreude, it is also a sign of just how hard and how indiscriminately it is hitting. All of a sudden, it's getting a lot harder to protect against what is coming. What is coming? Much more fire, much more often, burning much more land. Over the last five decades, the wildfire season in the western United States has already grown by two and a half months. Of the ten years with the most wildfire activity on record, nine have occurred since 2000. Globally, since just 1979, the season has grown by nearly 20%. The American wildfires now burn twice as much land as they did as recently as 1970. By 2050, destruction from wildfires is expected to double again. And in some places within the United States, the area burned could grow fivefold. For every additional degree of global warming, it could quadruple. What this means is that at 3 degrees of warming, our likely benchmark for the end of the century. The United States might be dealing with 16 times as much devastation from fire as we are today, when in a single year, 10 million acres were burned. At 4 degrees of warming, the fire season would be 4 times worse still. The California fire captain believes the term is already outdated. We don't even call it fire season anymore, he said in 2017. Take the season out, it's year-round. But wildfires are not an American affliction. They are a global pandemic. In icy Greenland, fires in 2017 appeared to burn 10 times more area than in 2014. And in Sweden, in 2018, forests in the Arctic Circle went up in flames. Fires that far north may seem innocuous, relatively speaking, since there are not so many people up there. But they are increasingly more rapidly than fires in lower latitudes, and they concern climate scientists greatly. The soot and ash they give off can land on and blacken ice seeds, which then absorbs more of the sun's rays and melt more quickly. Another Arctic fire broke out on the Russia-Finland border in 2018, and smoke from Siberian fires that summer reached all the way to the mainland United States. That same month, the 21st century's second deadliest wildfire had swept through the Greek seaside, killing 95. At one resort, dozens of guests tried to escape the flames by descending a narrow stone staircase into the Aegean, only to be engulfed along the way, dying literally in each other's arms. The effects of these fires are not linear or neatly additive. 
it might be more accurate to say that they initiate a new set of biological cycles. Scientists warn that even as California is baked into brush by a drier future, making inevitable more and more damaging fires, the probability of unprecedented seeming rainfalls will grow too, as much as a threefold increase of events like that which produced the state's great flood of 1862. And mudslides are among the clearest illustrations of what new horrors that heralds in Santa Barbara that January. The town's low-lying homes were pounded by the mountains detritus cascading down the hillside toward the ocean in an endless brown river. One father, in a panic, put his young children up on his kitchen's marble countertop thinking it is the strongest feature of the house, then watched as a rolling boulder smashed through the bedroom where the children had been just moments before. One kindergartner who did not make it was found close to two miles from his home, in a gully traced by train tracks close to the waterfront, having been carried there presumably on a continuous wave of mud. Two miles. Each year, globally, between 260,000 and 600,000 people die from smoke from wildfires, and Canadian fires have been linked to spikes in hospitalization as far away as the stone seaboard of the United States. Drinking water in Colorado was damaged for years by the fallout from the single wildfire in 2002. In 2014, Canada's Northwest Territories were blanketed with wildfire smoke producing a 42% spike in hospital visits for respiratory ailments and what one study called a profound negative effect on individual well-being. One of the strongest emotions that people felt was isolation, the lead researcher later said. There is a sense of not being able to get away. Where do you go? There is smoke everywhere. When trees die by natural processes, by fire, at the hands of humans, they release into the atmosphere the carbon stored within them, sometimes for as long as centuries. In this way, they are like coal, which is why the effect of wildfires on emissions is among the most feared climate feedback loops that the world's forests, which have typically been carbon sinks, would become carbon sources, unleashing all that stored gas. The impact can be specially dramatic when the fires ravage forests arising out of peat. Peatland fires in Indonesia in 1997, for instance, released up to 2.6 billion tons of carbon, 40% of the average annual global emissions level. And more burning only means more warming, only means more burning. In California, a single wildfire can entirely eliminate the emissions gains made that year by all of the state's aggressive environmental policies. Fires of that scale happen now every year. In this way, they make a mockery of the technocratic, meliorist approach to emissions reduction. In the Amazon, which in 2010 suffered its second 100-year drought in the space of five years, 100,000 fires were found to be burning in 2017. At present, the trees of the Amazon take in a quarter of all the carbon absorbed by the planet's forest each year. But in 2018, Jair Bolsonaro was elected president of Brazil, promising to open the rainforest to development, which is to say deforestation. How much damage can one person do to the planet? A group of Brazilian scientists has estimated that between 2021 and 2030, Bolsonaro's deforestation would release the equivalent of 13.12 gigatons of carbon. Last year, the United States estimated about 5 gigatons. This means that this one policy would have between 2 and 3 times the annual carbon impact of the entire American economy, with all of its aeroplanes and automobiles and coal plants. The world's worst emitter by far is China. The country was responsible for 9.1 gigatons of emissions in 2017. This means Bolsonaro's policy is the equivalent of adding, if just for a year, a whole second China to the planet's fossil fuel problem. And on top of that, a whole second United States. Globally, deforestation accounts for about 12% of carbon emissions, and forest fires produce as much as 25%. The ability of forest soils to absorb methane has fallen by 77% in just three decades.
and some of those studying the rate of tropical deforestation believe it could deliver an additional 1.5 degrees Celsius of global warming, even if fossil fuel emissions immediately ceased. Historically, the emissions rate from deforestation was even higher, with the clearing of woods and flattening of forests caused 30% of emissions from 1861 to 2000. Until 1980, deforestation played a greater role in increases of hottest day records than it did direct greenhouse gas emissions. There is a public health impact as well. Every square kilometer of deforestation produces 27 additional cases of malaria, thanks to what is called vector proliferation. When the trees are cleared out, the bugs move in. This is not simply a wildfire phenomenon. Its climate threat promises to trigger similarly brutal cycles. The fires should be terrorizing enough, but it is the cascading chaos that reveals the true cruelty of climate change. It can upend and turn violently against us, everything we have ever thought to be stable. Homes become weapons, roads become dead traps, air becomes poison, and the idyllic mountain vistas around which generations of entrepreneurs and spectaculars have assembled entire resort communities become themselves indiscriminate killers and are made with each successive destabilizing event only more likely to kill again. Disasters no longer natural. Humans used to watch the weather to prophesy the future. Going forward, we will see in its wrath the vengeance of the past. In the four degree warmer world, the Earth's ecosystem will boil with so many natural disasters that we will just start calling them weather. Out of control typhoons and tornadoes and floods and droughts. The planet assaulted regularly with climate events that not so long ago destroyed whole civilizations. The strongest hurricanes will come more often and we will have to invent new categories with which to describe them. Tornadoes will strike much more frequently and their trails of destruction could grow longer and wider. Hail rocks will quadruple in size. Early naturalists talked more about deep time, the perception they had complementing the grandeur of this valley or that rock basin, of the profound slowness of nature. But the perspective changes when history accelerates. What lies in store for us is more like what Aboriginal Australians talking with Victorian anthropologists called dream time, or everyone, the semi-mythical experience of encountering, in the present moment, an out-of-time past, when ancestors, heroes, and demigods crowded an epic state. You can find it already by watching footage of an iceberg collapsing into the sea, a feeling of history happening all at once. It is the summer of 2017 in the Northern Hemisphere brought unprecedented extreme weather, three major hurricanes arising in quick succession in the Atlantic, the epic 500,000 year rainfall of Hurricane Harvey dropping on Houston a million gallons of water for nearly every single person in the entire states of Texas. The wildfire of California, 9,000 of them burning through more than a million acres, and those in icy Greenland, 10 times bigger than those in 2014. The floods of South Asia, clearing 45 million from their homes. Then the record-breaking summer of 2018 made 2017 seem positively idyllic. It brought an unheard of global heat wave, with temperatures hitting 108 in Los Angeles, 122 in Pakistan and 124 in Algeria. In the world's oceans, six hurricanes and tropical storms appeared on the radars at once, including one typhoon Mankut that hit the Philippines and then Hong Kong, killing nearly a hundred and wreaking a billion dollars in damages, and another Hurricane Florence, which more than doubled the average annual rainfall in North Carolina, killing more than 50 and inflicting $17 billion worth of damage. There were wildfires in Sweden, all the way in the Arctic Circle, and across so much of the American West that half the continent was fighting through smoke, those fires ultimately burning close to 1.5 million acres. Parts of Yosemite National Park were closed. As were parts of Glacier National Park in Montana, where temperatures also topped 100. In 1850, the area had 150 glaciers. Today, all but 26 are melted. 
By 2040, the summer of 2018 will likely seem normal, but extreme weather is not a matter of normal. It is what roars back at us from the ever-worsening fringe of climate events. This is among the scariest features of rapid climate change. Not that it changes the everyday experience of the world, though it does that, and dramatically, but that it makes once unthinkable outlier events much more common, and ushers whole new categories of disaster into the realm of the possible. Already, storms have doubled since 1980, according to the European Academy Science Advisory Council. And it is now estimated that New York City will suffer 500-year floods once every 25 years. But sea level rise is more dramatic elsewhere, which means that storm surges will be distributed unequally. In some places, storms on that scale will hit even more frequently. The result is radically accelerated experience of extreme weather, which was once centuries worth of natural disaster compressed into just a decade or two. In the case of Hawaii's East Island, which disappeared underground during a single hurricane into a day or two. The climate effects on extreme precipitation events, often called deluges or even rain bombs, are even clearer than those on hurricanes, since the mechanism is about as straightforward as it gets. Warmer air can hold more moisture than cooler air. Already, there are 40% more intense rainstorms in the United States than in the middle of the last century. In the Northeast, the figure is 71%. The very heaviest downfalls are today three quarters heavier than they were in 1958. The island of Kauai in Hawaii is one of the wettest places on Earth and has in recent decades endured both tsunamis and hurricanes when a climate change driven rain event hit in April 2018. It literally broke the rain gauges and the National Weather Service had to offer a best case estimate 50 inches of water in 24 hours. When it comes to extreme weather, we are already living in unprecedented times. In America, the damages from quotidian thunderstorm, the unexceptional kind, have increased more than sevenfold since the 1980s. Power outages from storms have doubled just since 2003. When Hurricane Irma first emerged, it was with such intensity that some meteorologists proposed creating an entirely new category of hurricane for it, a Category 6. And then came Maria, rolling through the Caribbean and devastating a string of islands for the second time in a single week. Two storms of such intensity that the islands might be prepared to endure them once a generation, or perhaps even less often. In Puerto Rico, Maria wiped out power and running water from much of the island for months, flooding its agricultural lands so fully that one farmer predicted the island would not produce any food for the next year. In its aftermath, Maria also showed one of the uglier aspects of our climate blindness. Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens and live not far from the mainland on an island millions of Americans have visited personally. And yet, when climate disaster is struck there, we process their suffering, perhaps out of psychological self-interest, as foreign and far away. Trump barely mentioned Puerto Rico in the week after Maria. And while that may not surprise, neither did the Sunday talk shows. By the weekend, the few days after the hurricane transfers the island, it was off the front page of the New York Times as well. When Trump's feud with the heroic mayor of San Juan and his problematic visit to the island during which he tossed paper towels into a crowd without power or water like t-shirts at a Knicks game, made the hurricane a partisan issue. Americans did begin to focus on the destruction a bit more, but the attention paid remains trivial compared to the humanitarian toll. And when compared to the response to natural disasters that have recently hit the American mainland, we are getting some intimations of how the ruling class intends to handle the accumulating disasters of the Anthropocene. As the cultural theorist Mackenzie Werk of the New School wrote, we are on our own. And in the future, all that was once unprecedented becomes quickly routine. Remember Hurricane Sandy? By 2100, floods of that scale are expected as many as 17 times more often in New York. Katrina-level hurricanes are expected to double in frequency 
Looking globally, researchers have found an increase of 25 to 30 percent in category 4 and 5 hurricanes for just 1 degree Celsius of global warming. Between just 2006 and 2013, the Philippines were hit by 75 natural disasters. Over the last four decades in Asia, typhoons have intensified by between 12 and 15 percent, and the proportion of category 4 and 5 storms has doubled. In some areas, it has tripled. By 2070, Asian megacities could lose as much as $35 trillion in assets due to storms, up from just $3 trillion in 2005. We are so far from investing in adequate defenses against these storms that we are still building out into their paths, as though we are homesteaders staking claim to land cleared each summer by tornadoes, committing ourselves blindly to generations being punished by natural disaster. In fact, it is worse than that, since paving over stretches of vulnerable coast, as we have done most conspicuously in Houston and New Orleans, stops up natural drainage systems with concrete that extends its epic float. We tell ourselves we are developing the land, in some cases, fabricating it from Mars. What we are really building are bridges to our own suffering since it's not just those new concrete communities built right into the flood plain that are vulnerable, but all those communities behind them, built on the expectation that the old swampy coastline could protect them, which does call into question just what we mean, in the age of the Anthropocene, by the phrase natural disaster. Dream time weather won't stop at the shore, but will blanket the life of every human living on the planet, no matter how far from the coast. The warmer the Arctic, the more intense the blizzards in the northern latitudes. That's what's given the American North is 2010's Snowpocalypse, 2014's Snowmageddon, and 2016's Snowzilla. The inland effects of climate change are being felt in warmer seasons too. In April 2011, just one month, 758 tornadoes swept the American countryside. The previous April record had been 267, and the most for any previous month in recorded history was 542. The next month, there was another wave, including the tornado that killed 138 people in Joplin, Missouri. What's called America's Tornado Alley has moved 500 miles in just 30 years. And while technically, scientists aren't sure that climate change increases tornado formation, the parts of destruction tornado leave are getting longer, and they are getting wider. They arise from thunderstorms, which are increasing the number of days on which they are possible growing as much as 40% by 2100, according to one assessment. The United States Geological Survey, not a notably alarmist corner of even the temperamentally conservative federal bureaucracy, recently war gained an extreme weather scenario they called arc storm. Winter storms strike California, producing flooding in the Central Valley 300 miles long and 20 miles wide, and more destructive flooding in Los Angeles, Orange County, and the Bay Area up north, altogether forcing evacuation of more than a million Californians. Wind speeds reach hurricane levels of 125 miles per hour in parts of the state, and at least 60 miles per hour throughout much of it. Landslides cascade down from the Sierra Nevada mountains, and damage all told reaches $725 billion, nearly three times the estimate for a massive earthquake in the state, the much feared big one. In the past, even the recent past, disasters like this arrived with otherworldly force and incomprehensible moral logic. We could see them coming, on radar and by satellite but could not interpret them, not legibly, not in ways that really made sense of them in relation to one another. Even atheists and agnostics might find themselves whispering the phrase, act of God, in the aftermath of hurricane, or wildfire, or tornado, if only to express how inexplicable it felt to endure such suffering with no altar behind it, no one to blame for it. Climate change will change this. Even as we settle into thinking of natural disasters as a regular feature of our weather, the scope of devastation and horror they bring will not diminish. There are cascade effects here too. Ahead of Hurricane Harvey, the state of Texas cut off Houston's air quality monitors, fearing they would be damaged. Immediately afterward, 
A cloud of unbearable smells began drifting out of the city's petrochemical plants. Ultimately, nearly half a billion gallons of industrial wastewater surged out of a single petrochemical plant into Galveston Bay. All told that one storm produced more than 100 toxic releases, including 460,000 gallons of gasoline, 52,000 pounds of crude oil, and a massive quarter-mile-wide discharge of hydrogen chloride, which when it mixes with moisture becomes hydrochloric acid, which can burn, suffocate, and kill. Down the coast in New Orleans, the storm hit was less direct, but there the city had already been knocked offline without a full complement of drain pumps after an August 5 storm. When Katrina had hit New Orleans in 2005, it was not walloping a thriving city. The 2000 population of 480,000 had declined from a peak of over 600,000 in 1960. After the storm, it was as low as 230,000. Houston is a different case. One of the fastest growing cities in the country in 2017, Greater Houston even included the fastest growing suburb in the country that year. It has more than five times as many residents as New Orleans. It's a tragic irony that many of those new arrivals who moved into the path of this storm over the last decades were brought there by the oil business, which has worked tirelessly to undermine public understanding of climate change and derail global attempts at reducing carbon emissions. One suspects this is not the last 500-year storm those workers will see before retirement, nor the last to be seen by the hundreds of oil rigs of the coast of Houston or the thousand more bobbing now elsewhere of the Gulf Coast, until the toll of our emissions becomes so brutally clear that those rigs are finally retired. The phrase 500-year storm is also very helpful on the question of resilience. Even a devastated community, buckled in suffering, can endure a long period of recovery if it is wealthy and politically stable and needs to rebuild only once a century. Perhaps, even once every 50 years. But rebuilding for a decade in the wake of spectacular storms that hit once a decade or once every two decades is an entirely different matter. Even for countries as rich as the United States and regions as well off as Greater Houston, New Orleans is still reeling from Katrina a dozen years on, with the lower ninth ward barely one third as populated as it was before the storm. And it surely doesn't help that the entire coastline of Louisiana is being swallowed by the sea, with 2,000 square miles already gone. The state loses a football field of land every single hour. In the Florida Keys, 150 miles of road need to be raised by stay ahead of sea level, costing as much as $7 million each mile, or up to $1 billion total. The country's 2008 road budget was $25 million. For the world's poor recovery from storms, like Katrina and Irma and Harvey hitting more and more often, it's almost impossible. The best choice is often simply to live. In the months after Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico, thousands of inlanders arrived in Florida, thinking it might be for good. Of course, that land is disappearing too. Fresh water drain 71% of the planet is covered in water. Barely, more than 2% of that water is fresh, and only 1% of that water, at most, is accessible, with the risk trapped mostly in glaciers. Which means, in essence, as National Geographic has calculated, only 0.007% of the planet's water is available to fuel and feed its 7 billion people. Think of fresh water shortages and you probably feel an itch in your throat. But in fact, hydration is just a sliver of what we need water for. Globally, between 70 and 80% of fresh water is used for food production and agriculture, with an additional 10 to 20% set aside for industry. And the crisis is not principally driven by climate change. That 0.007% should be, believe it or not, plenty, not just for the 7 billion of us here, but for as many as 9 billion, perhaps even a bit more. Of course, we are likely heading north of 9 billion this century, 
to a global population of at least 10 and possibly 12 billion. As with food scarcity, much of the growth is expected in parts of the world already most strained by water shortage, in this case, urban Africa. In many African countries already, you are expected to get by on as little as 20 liters of water each day. Less than half of what water organizations say is necessary for public health. As soon as 2030, global water demand is expected to outstrip supply by 40%. Today, the crisis is political, which is to say not inevitable or necessary or beyond our capacity to fix and therefore functionally elective. This is one reason it is nevertheless harrowing as a climate parable. An abundance resource made scarce through governmental neglect and indifference, bad infrastructure and contamination, careless urbanization and development. There is no need for a water crisis. In other words, but we have one anyway, and aren't doing much to address it. Some cities lose more water to leaks than they deliver to homes, even in the United States. Leaks and theft account for an estimated loss of 16% of fresh water. In Brazil, the estimate is 40%. In both cases, as everywhere, scarcity plays out so nakedly on a stage defined by have and have not inequalities that the resulting drama of resource competition can hardly be called truly a competition. The deck is so stacked that water shortage looks more like a tool of inequality. The global result is that as many as 2.1 billion people around the world do not have access to safe drinking water, and 4.5 billion don't have safety managed water for sanitation. Like global warming, the water crisis is solvable at present. But that 0.007% leaves an awfully thin margin and climate change will cut into it. Half of the world's population depends on seasonal mail from high elevation snow and ice, deposits that are dramatically threatened by warming. Even if we hit the Paris targets, the glaciers of Himalayas will lose 40% of their ice by 2100, or possibly more, and there could be widespread water shortages in Peru and California, the result of glacier melt. At 4 degrees, the snow-capped Alps could look more like Morocco's Atlas Mountains, with 70% less snow by the end of the century. As soon as 2020, as many as 250 million Africans could face water shortages due to climate change, by the 2050s, the number could hit a billion people in Asia alone. By the same year, the World Bank found fresh water availability in cities around the world could decline by as much as two-thirds. Overall, according to the United Nations, 5 billion people could have poor access to fresh water by 2050. The United States won't be spared. Boomtown Phoenix is, for instance, already in emergency planning mode which should not surprise, given that even London is beginning to worry over water shortages. But given the reassurances of wealth, which can buy stopgap solutions and additional short-term supply, the United States will not be the worst hit. In India, already 600 million face high to extreme water stress, according to a 2018 government report, and 200,000 people die each year from lacking or contaminated water. By 2030, according to the same report, India will have only half the water it needs. In 1947, when the country was formed, per capita water availability in Pakistan stood at 5,000 cubic meters. Today, thanks mostly to population growth, it is at 1,000. And soon, continued growth and climate change will bring it down to 400. In the last 100 years, many of the planet's largest lakes have begun drying up. From the Aral Sea in Central Asia, which was once the world's fourth largest and which has lost more than 90% of its volume in recent decades, to Lake Mead, which supplies much of Las Vegas water and has lost as much as 400 billion gallons in a single year. Lake Pupo, once Bolivia's second biggest, has completely disappeared. Iran's Lake Urmia has shrunk more than 80% in 30 years. Lake Chad has more or less evaporated entirely. Climate change is only one factor in this story, but its impact is not going to shrink over time. 
what goes on within those legs that survive is perhaps just as distressing. In China's Lake Tai, for instance, the blooming of warm water friendly bacteria in 2007 threatened the drinking water of 2 million people. The heating up of East Africa's lake Tanganyika has imperiled the fish stock harvested and eaten by millions in four adjacent hungry nations. Freshwater lakes, by the way, account for up to 16% of the world's natural methane emissions. And scientists estimate that climate-fueled aquatic plant growth could double those emissions over the next 50 years. We are already racing as a short-term fix for the world's drought boom to drain underground water deposits known as aquifers, but those deposits took millions of years to accumulate and aren't coming back anytime soon. In the United States, aquifers already supply a fifth of our water needs, as Brian Clark Howard has noted. Wells that used to draw water at 500 feet now require pumps at least twice as deep. The Colorado River Basin, which serves water to seven states, lost 12 cubic miles of groundwater between 2004 and 2013. The Ogallala Aquifer in the part of the Texas Panhandle lost 15 feet in a decade and is expected to drain by 70% more the next 50 years in Kansas. In the meantime, they are fracking in that drinking water. In India, in just the next two years, 21 cities could exhaust their groundwater supply. The first day zero in Cape Town was in March 2018, the day when the city, a few months earlier and enduring its worst drought in decades, had predicted its taps would run proverbially dry. Sitting in a living room in a modern apartment in an advanced metropolis somewhere in the developed world, this threat may seem hard to credit. So many cities looking nowadays like fantasies of endless and on-demand abundance for the world's wealthy. But of all urban entitlements, the casual expectation of never-ending drinking water is perhaps the most deeply delusional. It takes quite a lot to bring that water to your sink, your shower, and your toilet. As climate crises so often do, in Cape Town, the drought aggravated existing conflicts. In a memorable first-person account written at the time, Cape Townian Adam Wells described the episode, which did end before the city went completely dry, as an operatic enactment of familiar local problems, mostly wealthy whites complaining that mostly poor blacks, many of whom receive a small allocation free, were draining the water supply. Social media aflame with accusations of idle or indifferent black South Africans leaving water pipes running unattended and shanty town businesses running off stolen water. Black South Africans pointed the finger at suburban whites with pools and lawns, making hay over orgies of flossing in the toilet stalls of off scale shopping malls. Conspiracy theories circulated involving federal indifference and withheld Israeli technology. An accusation of bad faith bounced from local authorities to national ones to meteorologists altogether serving, as is almost always the case, when communities must respond collectively to climate threats as a buffet of excuses to not act. At the peak of the crisis, the mayor announced that nearly two-thirds of the city, 64%, were failing to abide by the city's new water restrictions, which aim to limit water use to 23 gallons per person in each day. The average American goes through four to five times that much. In Erit Utah, founded on a Mormon prophecy predicting the arrival of Eden in the desert, the average citizen goes through each day 248 gallons. In February, Cape Town halved the individual allotment to 13 gallons, and the army prepared to secure the city's water facilities. But accusations of individual irresponsibility were a kind of weaponized red herring, as they often are in communities reckoning with the onset of climate pain. We frequently choose to obsess over personal consumption, in part because it is within our control and in part as a very contemporary form of virtuous signaling. But ultimately, those choices are 
in almost all cases, trivial contributors, ones that blind us to the more important forces. When it comes to fresh water, the bigger picture is this. Personal consumption amounts to such a thin sliver that only in the most extreme droughts can it even make a difference. Even before the drought, one estimate found that South Africa had 9 million people without any access to water for personal consumption at all. The amount of water required to satisfy the needs of those millions is only about one-third the amount of water used each year to produce the nation's wine crop. In California, wet droughts are punctuated by outrage over pools and evergreen lawns. Total urban consumption accounts for only 10%. In South Africa, eventually, the crisis passed, a combination of aggressive water rationing and the end of the dry season. But you could be forgiven, considering the news coverage of Cape Town, for thinking that the South African city was the first to stay down a day's year. In fact, Sao Paulo did it in 2015. After a two-year drought, limiting water use to 12 hours a day for some residents in an aggressive rationing system that shuttered businesses and forced mass layoffs. In 2008, Barcelona facing the worst drought the city had seen since Catalonians began keeping records, had to buzz in drinking water from France. In southern Australia, the millennium drought began with low rainfall in 1996 and continued through a dead valley, like trough that lasted eight years beginning in 2001 and ending only when La Nina rainfall finally relieved the area in 2010. Rice and cotton production in the region fell 99 and 84% respectively. Rivers and lakes shriveled up and wetlands turned acidic. In 2018, in the Indian city of Simla, once the summertime home of the British Raj, the taps ran dry for weeks in May and June. And while agriculture is often hit the hardest by shortages, water issues are not exclusively rural. 14 of the world's 20 biggest cities are currently experiencing water scarcity or drought. 4 billion people, it is estimated, already live in regions facing water shortages at least one month each year. That is about two-thirds of the planet's population. Half a billion are in places where the shortages never end. Today, at just one degree of warming, those regions with at least a month of water shortages each year include just about all of the United States west of Texas, where lakes and aquifers are being drained to meet demand and stretching up into western Canada and down to Mexico City, almost all of northern Africa and the Middle East, a large chunk of India, almost of Australia, significant part of Argentina and Chile, and everything in Africa south of Zambia. As long as it has had advocates, climate change has been sold under a saltwater banner, melting Arctic, rising seas, shrinking coastlines. A freshwater crisis is more alarming, since we depend on it far more acutely. It is also closer at hand. But while the planet commands the necessary resources today to provide water for drinking and sanitation to all the world's people, there is not a necessary political will or even the inclination to do so. Over the next three decades, water demand from the global food system is expected to increase by about 50%, from cities and industry by 50 to 70%, and from energy by 85%. And climate change, with its coming mega droughts, promises to tighten supply considerably. In fact, the World Bank, in its landmark study of water and climate change, high and dry, found that the impacts of climate change will be channeled primarily through the water cycle. The bank's foreboding warning that when it comes to the cruel cascading effects of climate change, water efficiency is as pressing a problem and as important a puzzle to solve as energy efficiency. Without any meaningful adaptation in the distribution of water resources, the World Bank estimates regional GDP could decline, simply due to water insecurity, by as much as 14% in the Middle East, 12% in Africa's Sahel, 11% in Central Asia, and 7% in East Asia. But of course, GDP is at best a crude measure of environmental cost, 
a more eye-opening ledger is kept by Peter Glick of the Pacific Institute. A simple list of all armed conflicts tied up with water issues, beginning in 3000 BC with the ancient Sumerian legend of Ea. Glick listed nearly 500 water-related conflicts since 1900. Almost half of the entire list is since just 2010. Part of that, Glick acknowledges, is a reflection of the relative abundance of recent data, and part of it is the changing nature of war. Conflicts that used to unfold almost exclusively between states are now in an era where state authority has weakened in many places, likely to spark within states and between groups. The five-year Syrian drought that stretched from 2006 to 2011, producing crop failures that created political instability and helped usher in the civil war that produced a global refugee crisis is one vivid example. Glick is personally more focused on the strange war unfolding in Yemen since 2015, technically a civil war, but practically a proxy regional war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and conceptually a sort of world war in miniature with American and Russian involvement as well. There, the humanitarian cost has been carried as much by water as by blood, in part because of targeted attacks on water infrastructure. The number of cholera cases grew to 1 million in 2017, which means in a single year, roughly 4% of the country contracted the disease. There is a saying in the water community, Glick tells me, if climate change is a shark, the water resources are the thief. Dying Oceans We tend to see oceans as unfathomable, the closest thing we have on this planet to outer space. Dark, forbidding, and especially in the depth, quite weird and mysterious. Who has known the ocean? Rachel Carson wrote in her essay, Undersea, published 25 years before, she tackled the discreation of the planet's land by human hands, an industrial cure-alls in silent spring. Neither you nor I, with our earth-bound senses, know the form and source of the tide that beats over the crab hiding under the seaweed of his tight pool home, or the lilt of the long, slow swells of mid-ocean, where souls of wandering fish prey and are preyed upon and the dolphin breaks the waves to breathe the upper atmosphere. But the ocean isn't the other. We are. Water is not a beachside attraction for land animals. At 70% of the Earth's surface it is, by an enormous margin, the planet's predominant environment. Along with everything else it does, oceans feed us. Globally, seafood accounts for nearly a fifth of all animal protein in the human diet and in coastal areas, it can provide much more. The oceans also maintain our planetary seasons through prehistoric currents like the Gulf Stream and modulate the temperature of the planet, absorbing much of the heat of the sun. Perhaps has fed, has maintained, and has modulated our better terms since global warming threatens to undermine each of those functions. Already, fish populations have migrated north by hundreds of miles in search of colder waters, floundered by 250 miles of the American East Coast, mackerel so far from their continental home that the fishermen chasing them are no longer bound by rules set by the European Union. One study tracing human impact on marine life found only 13% of the ocean undamaged, and parts of the Arctic have been so transformed by warming that scientists are beginning to wonder how long they can keep calling those waters Arctic, and however much sea level rise and coastal flooding have dominated our fears about the impact of climate change on the planet's ocean water, there is much more than just that to worry over. At present, more than a fourth of the carbon emitted by humans is sucked up by the oceans, which also in the past 50 years have absorbed 90% of global warming's excess heat. Half of that heat has been absorbed since 1997, and today's seas carry at least 15% more heat energy than they did in that year 2000, absorbing three times as much additional energy in just those two decades as is contained in the entire planet's fossil fuel reserves. But the result of all that carbon dioxide absorption is what's called 
ocean acidification, which is exactly what it sounds like, and which is also already burning through some of the planet's water basins. You may remember this as the place where life arose in the first place, all on its own through its effect on phytoplankton, which releases sulfur into the air that helps cloud formation. Ocean acidification could add between a quarter and half of a degree of warming. You have probably heard of coral bleaching, that is coral dying, in which warmer ocean waters strip reefs of the protozoa, called zooxanthellae, that provide, through photosynthesis, up to 90% of the energy need of the coral. Each reef is an ecosystem as complex as a modern city, and the zooxanthellae are its food supply, the basic building block of an energy chain. Where they die, the whole complex is starved with military efficiency, a city under siege or blockage. Since 2016, as much as half of Australia's landmark, Great Barrier Reef has been stripped in this way. These large-scale die-outs are called mass bleaching events, one unfolded globally from 2014 to 2017. Already, coral life has declined so much that it has created an entirely new layer in the ocean, between 30 and 150 meters below the surface, which scientists have taken to calling a twilight zone. According to the World Resources Institute, by 2030, ocean warming and acidification will threaten 90% of all reefs. This is very bad news, because reefs support as much as a quarter of all marine life and supply food and income for half a billion people. They also protect against flooding from storm surges, a function that offers value in the many billions, with reefs presently worth at least $400 million annually to Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cuba, and Mexico, $400 million annually to each. Ocean acidification will also damage fish population directly. Those scientists aren't yet sure how to predict the effects on the stuff we haul out of the ocean to eat. They do know that in acid waters, oysters and mussels will struggle to grow their shells, and that rising carbon concentration will impair fish's sense of smell, which you may not have known they had, but which often aids in navigation. Off the coast of Australia, fish production have declined an estimated 32% in just 10 years. It has become quite common to say that we are living through a mass extinction, a period in which human activity has multiplied the rate at which species are disappearing from the earth by a factor perhaps as large as a thousand. It is probably also fair to call this an era marked by what is called ocean anoxification. Over the past 50 years, the amount of ocean water with no oxygen at all has quadrupled globally, giving us a total of more than 400 dead zones. Oxygen-deprived zones have grown by several million square kilometers, roughly the size of all of Europe, and hundreds of coastal cities now sit on fated, under-oxygenated ocean. This is partly due to the simple warming of the planet, since warmer waters can carry less oxygen, but it is also partly the result of straightforward pollution. A recent Gulf of Mexico dead zone, all 9,000 square miles of it, was powered by the runoff of fertilizer chemicals washing into the Mississippi from the industrial farms of the Midwest. In 2014, another typical toxic event struck Lake Erie, when fertilizer from corn and soy farms in Ohio spawned an algae bloom that cut off drinking water for Toledo. And in 2018, a dead zone the size of Florida was discovered in the Arabian Sea, so big that researchers believed it might encompass the entire 63,700 square mile Gulf of Oman, seven times the size of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. The ocean, said the lead researcher Bastian Koister, is suffocating. Dramatic declines in ocean oxygen have played a role in many of the planet's worst mass extinctions and this process by which dead zones grow, choking off marine life and wiping out fisheries is already quite advanced, not only in the Gulf of Mexico but just off Namibia, where hydrogen sulfide is bubbling out of the sea along a thousand mile stretch of land known as the Skeleton Coast. The name originally referred to the detritus of wrecked ships, but today it is more apt than ever. 
Hydrogen sulfide is also one of the things scientists suspect finally kept the end Permian extinction once all the feedback loops had been triggered. It is so toxic that evolution has trained us the tiniest, safest traces, which is why our noses are so exquisitely skilled at registering flatulence. And then there is the possible slowdown of the ocean conveyor belt. The great circulatory system made up of the Gulf Stream and other currents that is the primary way the planet regulates regional temperatures. How does this work? The water of the Gulf Stream cools off in the atmosphere of the Norwegian Sea, making the water itself denser which sends it down into the bottom of the ocean, where it is then pushed southward by more Gulf Stream water, itself cooling in the north and falling to the ocean floor, eventually all the way to Antarctica, where the cold water returns to the surface and begins to heat up and travel north. The trip can take a thousand years. As soon as the conveyor belt became the subject of real study, in the 1980s, there were those oceanographers who worried it might shut down, which would lead to a dramatic disequilibration of the planet's climate, the hotter parts getting much hotter and the colder parts much colder. A total shutdown would be inconceivably catastrophic, though the impacts look deceptively innocuous on first scan. A colder Europe, more intense weather, additional sea level rise. Invariably, this is described as the day after tomorrow scenario. And it is a strange twist of faith that so forgettable a movie has become the memorable shorthand for this particular worst case nightmare. A shutdown of the conveyor belt is not a scenario that any credible scientist worry about on any human time scale, but a slowdown is another matter. Already, climate change has depressed the velocity of Gulf Stream by as much as 15%, a development that scientists call an unprecedented event in the past millennium, believed to be one reason the sea level rise along the east coast of the United States is dramatically higher than anywhere else in the world. And in 2018, two major papers triggered a new wave of concern over the conveyor belt, technically called Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, which was found to be moving at its slowest rate in at least 1,500 years. This had happened about 100 years ahead of the schedule of even alarmed scientists and marked what the climate scientist Michael Mann called ominously a tipping point. Further change, of course, is to come. The transformation of the ocean by warming, making these unknown waters doubly unknowable. Remodeling the planet's seas before we were able to discover their depth and all the life summers there. Unbreathable air. Our lungs need oxygen, but it is only a fraction of what we breathe and the fraction tends to decline the more carbon is in the atmosphere. That doesn't mean we are at risk of suffocation. Oxygen is far too abundant for that, but we will nevertheless suffer. With CO2 at 930 parts per million, more than double where we are today, cognitive ability declines by 21%. The effects are more pronounced indoors, where CO2 tends to build up. That's one reason you probably feel a little more awake when taking a brisk walk outside when you do after spending a long day inside with the windows closed. And it's also a reason elementary school classrooms have been found. By one study, to already average 1,000 parts per million, with almost a quarter of those surveyed in Texas over 3,000. Quite alarming numbers, given that these are the environments we have designed to promote intellectual performance. But classrooms are not the worst offenders. Other stories have shown even higher concentrations on airplanes with effects you can probably gradually recall from past experience. But carbon is more or less the least of it. Going forward, the planet's air won't just be warmer. It will likely to be dirtier, more oppressive and more sickening. Droughts have a direct impact on air quality, producing what is now known as dust exposure, and in the days of the American dust ball was called dust pneumonia. Climate change will bring new dust storm to those plain states, where deaths from dust pollution are expected to more than double and hospitalization to triple. The hotter the planet gets, the more ozone forms, 
and by the middle of the century, Americans would suffer a 70% increase in days with unhealthy ozone smoke, the National Center for Atmospheric Research has projected. By the 1990s, as many as 2 billion people globally will be breathing air above the World Health Organization safe level. Already, more than 10,000 people die from air pollution daily. This is considerably more each day than the total number of people who have ever been affected by the meltdowns of nuclear reactors. This is not a slam dunk argument in favor of nuclear power. Of course, since the comparison isn't so neat, there are many many more fossil fuel chimneys discoursing their trails of black smoke than fission facilities with their finger trap towers and clouds of white vapor. But it is a startling mark of just how all-encompassing our design of carbon pollution really is, enclosing the planet in a toxic sodal. In recent years, researchers have uncovered a whole secret history of adversity woven into the experience of the last half century by the hand of leaded gasoline and lead paint, which seem to have dramatically increased rates of intellectual disability and criminality and dramatically decreased educational attainment and lifetime earnings wherever they were introduced. The effects of air pollution seem starker already. Small particulate pollution, for instance, lowers cognitive performance over time so much that researchers call the effect huge. Reducing Chinese pollution to the EPA standard, for instance, would improve the country's verbal test score by 13% and its math scores by 8%. Pollution has been linked with increased mental illness in children and the likelihood of dementia in adults. A higher pollution level in the air a baby is born has been shown to reduce earnings and labor force participation at age 30, and the relationship of pollution to premature births and low birth weight of babies is so strong that the simple introduction of EZ pass in American cities reduced both problems in the vicinity of toll plazas by 10.8% and 11.8% respectively just by cutting down on the exhaust expelled when cars slowed to pay the toll. Then there is the more familiar health threat from pollution. In 2013, melting Arctic ice remodeled Asian weather patterns, depriving industrial China of the natural wind ventilation patterns it had come to depend on, and as a result, blanketing much of the country's north in an unbreathable smoke. An obtuse seeming metric called the Air Quality Index categorizes the risk according to an idiosyncratic unit scale tabulating the presence of a variety of pollutants. The warnings begin at 51 to 100 and at 201 to 300 include promises of significant increase in respiratory effects in the general population. The index tops out with the 301 to 500 trains, warning of serious aggravation of heart or lung disease and premature mortality in persons with cardiopulmonary disease and the elderly and serious risk of respiratory effects in the general population. At that level, everyone should avoid all outdoor exertion. The Chinese air collapse of 2013 doubled the high end of that upper range, reaching a peak air quality index of 993. And scientists studying the phenomenon suggested that China has inadvertently invented an entire new and unstudied kind of smoke, one that combined the pea soup population of industrial era Europe and the small particulate pollution that has lately contaminated so much of the developing world. That year, smoke was responsible for 1.37 million deaths in the country. Outside of China, most saw the photographs and video of a world capital blanketed by grey so thick it blotted out the sun as a sign, not of the state of the planet's atmosphere, but of just how backward that one country was, just how far China lagged behind the quality of life indices of the first world. Whatever its rapid economic growth suggested about its place in the global pecking order. Then in the record California wildfire season of 2017, the air around San Francisco was worse than on the same day in Beijing. In Napa, the air quality index hit 486. In Los Angeles, there was a run on surgical masks. In Santa Barbara, residents scooped ash from drain pipes by the handful. 
In Seattle, the following year, wildfire smoke made it unsafe for everyone anywhere to breathe outside, which gave Americans one more reason, panic, about their own health, to look away from the situation in Delhi, where in 2017, the air quality index reached 999. The Indian capital is home to 26 million people. In 2017, simply breathing its air was the equivalent of smoking more than two packs of cigarettes a day and local hospitals saw a patient source of 20%. Runners in Delhi's half marathon competed with their heads wrapped by white masks, and air that thick with smut is hazardous in other ways. Visibility was so low that cars crashed in pileups on Delhi's highways, and United cancelled flights in and out of the city. New research shows that even short-term exposure to particulate pollution can dramatically increase rates of respiratory infections, with every additional 10 micrograms per cubic meter associated with a rise in diagnosis between 15 and 32 percent. Blood pressure goes up too. In 2017, the Lancet reported 9 million premature deaths globally were from small particulate pollution. More than a quarter were in India. And that was before final figures were in from that year's spike. In Delhi, much of the pollution comes from the burning of nearby farmland. But elsewhere, small particulate smoke is produced primarily by diesel and gas exhaust and other industrial activity. The public health damage is indiscriminate, touching nearly every human vulnerability. Pollution increases prevalence of stroke, heart disease, cancer of all kinds, acute and chronic respiratory diseases like asthma and adverse pregnancy outcomes, including premature birth. New research into the behavioral and development effects is perhaps even scarier. Air pollution has been linked to worse memory, attention and vocabulary and to ADHD and autism spectrum disorders. Pollution has been shown to damage the development of neurons in the brain and proximity to a coal plant can deform your DNA. In the developing world, 98% of cities are enveloped by air above the threshold of safety, established by the WHO, World Health Organization. Get out of urban areas and the problem doesn't just improve. 95% of the world's population is breathing dangerously polluted air. Since 2013, China has undertaken an unprecedented cleanup of its air, but as of 2015, pollution was still killing more than a million Chinese each year. Globally, one out of six deaths is caused by air pollution. Pollution like this isn't news in any meaningful sense. You can find omens about the toxicity of smoke and the dangers of blackened air. For instance, in the writing of Charles Dickens, really appreciated as an environmentalist. But every year, we are discovering more and more ways in which our industrial activity is poisoning the planet. One particular note of alarm has been struck by what seems like an entirely new or newly understood pollution threat, microplastic. Global warming did not bring us microplastics in any direct way, and yet the rapid conquest of our natural world has become an irresistible fable about just what kind of transformation is meant by the word Anthropocene, and just how much of the world's booming consumer culture is to blame. Environmentalists probably know already about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the mass of plastic twice the size of Texas floating freely in the Pacific Ocean. It is not actually an island. In fact, it is not actually a stable mass, only rhetorically convenient for us to think of it that way. And it is most composed of large-scale plastics, of the kind visible to the human eye. The microscopic bits, 700,000 of them, can be released into the surrounding environment by a single washing machine cycle are more insidious. And believe it or not, more pervasive, a quarter of fish sold in Indonesia and California contain plastics, according to one study. European eaters of shellfish, one estimate has suggested, consume at least 11,000 bits each year. The direct effect on ocean life is even more striking. The total number of marine species said to be adversely affected by plastic pollution has risen from 260 in 1995 when the first assessment was carried out to 690 in 2015 and 1450 in 2018. 
a majority of fish tested in the Great Lakes contained microplastics, as did the guts of 73% of fish surveyed in the Northwest Atlantic. One UK supermarket study found that every 100 grams of mussels were infested with 70 particles of plastic. Some fish have learned to eat plastic, and certain species of krill are now functioning as plastic processing plants, turning microplastics into smaller bits that scientists are now calling nanoplastics. But krill can't grind it all down. In one square mile of water near Toronto, 3.4 million microplastic particles were recently trolled. Of course, seabirds are not immune. One researcher found 225 pieces of plastic in the stomach of a single three-month-old chick, weighing 10% of its body mass, the equivalent of an average human carrying about 10 to 20 pounds of plastic in a distended belly. Imagine having to take your first flight out to sea with all that in your stomach, the researcher told the Financial Times, adding, around the world, seabirds are declining faster than any other bird group. Microplastics have been found in beer, honey, and 16 of 17 tested brands of commercial sea salt across eight different countries. The more we test, the more we find. And while nobody yet knows the health impact on humans, in the oceans, a plastic microbead is said to be one million times more toxic than the water around it. Chances are, if we started slicing open human cadavers to look for microplastics, as we are beginning to do with tau proteins, the supposed markers of CTE and Alzheimer's, we would be finding plastic in our own flesh too. We can breathe in microplastics, even when indoors, where they have been detected suspended in the air, and do already drink them. They are found in the tap water of 94% of all tested American cities, and global plastic production is expected to triple by 2050, when there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Plastic panic has a strange relationship to climate change, in that it seems to draw on premonitions about the degradation of the planet while focusing on something that has very little to do with global warming. But it's not only carbon emissions that are tied up in climate change, other pollution is too. One of the connections is relatively attenuated. Plastics are produced by industrial activity that also produces pollutants, including carbon dioxide. A second is more direct, but in the scheme of things, trivial. When plastics degrade, they release methane and ethylene, another powerful greenhouse gas. But a third relationship between non-carbon pollution and the temperature of the planet is far more horrifying. This is not the problem of plastic, but of aerosol pollution, the blanket term for any particles suspended in our atmosphere. Aerosol particles actually suppress global temperature mostly by reflecting sunlight back into outer space. In other words, all of the non-carbon pollution we have exhausted from our power plants and our factories and our automobiles suffocating some of the largest and most prosperous cities of the world and consigning many millions of the lucky to hospital beds and many millions of others to early deaths. All of that pollution has been perversely reducing the amount of global warming we are currently experiencing. How much? Probably about half a degree and possibly more. Already, aerosols have been reflecting so much sunlight away from the earth that in the industrial era, the planet has only heated up two-thirds as much as it would have otherwise. If we had somehow managed to produce precisely the same volume of carbon emissions since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution as we have, while somehow keeping the skies clear of aerosol pollutions, the temperature rise would be half again higher than it is now. The result is what the Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen has called a catch-22, and what the climate writer Eric Holthaus has described, perhaps more incisively, as a devil's bargain a choice between public health destroying pollution on the one hand and on the other hand clear skies whose very clearness and healthiness will dramatically accelerate climate change eliminate that pollution and you save millions of lives each year but also create a dramatic spike in warming that would bring us to between 1.5 and 2 degrees warmer than the pre-industrial baseline, pushing us right up to the threshold of 2 degrees of warming 
long thought to be the border separating a livable future from climate catastrophe. For almost a generation now, engineers and futurists have contemplated the practical implications of this phenomenon and the prospect of suppressing global temperature with a program of suspended particles that is polluting the air on purpose to keep the planet cooler. Often grouped together under the umbrella term geoengineering, this prospect has been received by the public as a worst-case scenario, nearly science fiction, and has, in fact, informed much of the recent sci-fi that has addressed itself to the climate crisis. And yet it has gained a terrific amount of currency among the most concerned climate scientists, many of whom will also note that none of the quite modest goals of the Paris Climate Accords can be achieved without negative emissions technologies, at present prohibitively expensive. Carbon capture may indeed prove to be magical thinking, but the cruder technologies we know this will work. Rather than sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, we could shoot pollution into the sky on purpose. Perhaps the most plausible version involves sulfur dioxide. That would turn our sunsets very red, would bleach the sky, would make more acid rain. It would also cause tens of thousands of additional premature deaths each year through its effect on air quality. A 2018 paper suggested it would rapidly dry the Amazon, producing many more wildfires. The negative effect on plant growth would entirely cancel out the positive effect on global temperature, according to another 2018 paper. In other words, at least in terms of agricultural yield, solar geoengineering would offer no net benefit at all. Once we begin such a program, we could never stop. Even a brief interruption, a temporary dispersal, of our red sulfur umbrella could send the planet plunging several degrees of warming forward into a climate abyss, which would make whatever installations were sustaining that umbrella quite vulnerable to political gamesmanship and terrorism, as its advocates themselves would acknowledge. And yet, many scientists still describe geoengineering as an inevitably, it's just so cheap, they say. Even an environmentalist billionaire going rogue could make it happen on their own. Plague of Warming Rock is a record of planetary history, eras as long as millions of years flattened by the forces of geological time into strata with amplitude of just inches or just an inch or even less. Ice works that way too, as a climate laser, but it is also frozen history, some of which can be reanimated when unfrozen. They are now trapped in Arctic ice, diseases that have not circulated in the air for millions of years, in some cases since before humans were around to encounter them, which means our immune systems would have no idea how to fight back when those prehistoric plays emerge from the ice. Already in laboratories, Several microbes have been reanimated. A 32,000 year old extremophile bacteria revived in 2005. An 8 million year old bug brought back to life in 2007. A 3.5 million year old one a Russian scientist self injected. Out of curiosity, just to see what would happen, he survived. In 2018, scientists revived something a bit bigger a worm that had been frozen in permafrost for the last 42,000 years. The Arctic also stores terrifying diseases from more recent times. In Alaska, researchers have discovered remnant of the 1918 flu that infected as many as 500 million and killed as many as 50 million, about 3% of the world's population and almost six times as many as had died in the World War for which the pandemic served as a kind of gruesome capstone. Scientists suspect smallpox and the bubonic plague are trapped in Serbian ice, among many other diseases that have otherwise passed into human legend. An upraised history of devastating sickness left out like egg salad in the Arctic zone. Many of these frozen organisms won't actually survive the thaw. Those that have been brought back to life have been reanimated typically under fastidious lab conditions. But in 2016, a boy was killed and 20 others infected by anthrax released 
when retreating permafrost exposed the frozen carcass of a reindeer killed by the bacteria at least 75 years earlier. More than 2,000 present-day reindeer died. What concerns epidemiologists more than ancient diseases are existing scores relocated, rewired, or even re-evolved by warming. The first effect is geographical. Before the early modern period, human provinciality was a guard against pandemic. A bug could wipe out a town or a kingdom or even in an extreme case, devastate a continent. But in most instances, it could not travel much farther than its victims, which is to say not very far at all. The Black Death killed as much as 60% of Europe, but consider for a gruesome counterfactual how big its impact might have been in a truly globalized world. Today, even with globalization and the rapid intermingling of human populations, our ecosystems are mostly stable and this functions as another limit. We know where certain bugs can spread and know the environments in which they cannot. This is why certain vectors of adventure tourism require dozens of new vaccines and prophylactic medications and why new workers traveling to London don't need to worry. But global warming will scramble those ecosystems, meaning it will help these trespass those limits as surely as court is did. The footprint of every mosquito-borne illness is presently circumscribed, but those borders are disappearing rapidly as the tropics expand. The current rate is 30 miles per decade. In Brazil, for generations, yellow fever set in the Amazon basin, where the Hemagogos and Savites mosquitoes thrived, making the disease a concern for those who lived, worked, or traveled deep into the jungle, but only for them. In 2016, it left the Amazon as more and more mosquitoes fanned out of the rainforest. And by 2017, it had reached areas around the country's megalopolises, Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, more than 30 million people, many of them living in sandy towns, facing the arrival of a disease that kills between 3 and 8% of those infected. Yellow fever is just one of the plagues that will be carried by mosquitoes as they migrate, conquering more and more of a warming world, the globalization of pandemic disease. Malaria alone kills a million people each year already, infecting many more. But you don't worry much about it if you are living in Maine or France. As the tropics creep northward and mosquitoes migrate with them, you may, over the course of the next century, more and more of the world's population will be living under the shadow of the diseases like this. You did not much worry about Zika before a couple of years ago either. As it happens, Zika may also be a good model of a second worrying effect, disease mutation. One reason you hadn't heard about Zika until recently is that it had been trapped in Uganda and Southeast Asia. Another is that it did not until recently appear to cause birth defects. Scientists still don't entirely understand what happened or what they missed. Even now, several years after the planet seemed creeped by panic about microcephaly. It could be that the disease changed as it came to the Americas, the result of a genetic mutation or inadaptive response to a new environment, or that Zika produces those devastating prenatal effects only when another disease is present, possibly one less common in Africa, or that something about the environment or immunological history in Uganda protects mothers and their unborn children. But there are things we do know for sure about how climate affects some diseases. Malaria, for instance, thrives in hotter regions, which is one reason the World Bank estimates that by 2030, 3.6 billion people will be reckoning with it, 100 million as a direct result of climate change. Projections like those depend not just on climate models, but on an integrated understanding of the organism at play, or rather, organisms. Malaria transformation involves both the disease and the mosquito. Lyme disease, both the disease and the tick, which is another epidemiologically threatening creature whose universe is rapidly expanding, thanks to global warming. As Mary Beth Pfeiffer has documented, Lyme case counts have spiked in Japan, Turkey and South Korea, where the disease was literally non-existent as recently as 2010 zero cases and now lives inside hundreds more Koreans each year. 
In the Netherlands, 54% of the country's land is now infested. In Europe as a whole, lime case loads are now three times the standard level. In the United States, there are likely around 300,000 new infections each year. And since many of even those treated for Lyme continues to show symptoms years after treatment, the numbers can stockpile. Overall, the number of disease cases from mosquitoes, ticks, and fleas have tripled in the United States over just the last 13 years, with dozens of counties across the country encountering ticks for the first time. But the effects of the epidemic can be seen, perhaps, most clearly in animals other than humans. In Minnesota, during the 2000s, winter ticks have dropped the moose population by 58% in a single decade, and some environmentalists believe the species could be eradicated entirely from the state as soon as 2020. In New England, dead moose calves have been found suckling as many as 90,000 engorged ticks, often killing the calves not through Lyme disease but simple anemia. The effect of that number of bugs is drawing a few millimeters of blood from the moose. Those that survive are far from robust, many having scratched so incessantly at their own hides to clear it of ticks that they completely eliminated their own hair, leaving behind a spooky gray skin that has earned them the name Ghost Moose. Lyme is still, in relative terms, a young disease, and one we don't yet understand all that well. We attribute a very mysterious and incoherent set of symptoms to it, from joint pain to fatigue to memory loss to facial palsy, almost as a catch-all explanation for ailments we cannot pinpoint in patients who we know have been bitten by a bug carrying the bug. We do know ticks, however, as surely as we know malaria. There are not many parasites we understand better, but there are many, many millions we understand worse, which means our sense of how climate change will redirect or remodel them is shrouded in a foreboding ignorance. And then there are the plagues that climate change will confront us with for the very first time. A whole new universe of diseases humans have never before known to even worry about. New universe is not hyperbole. Scientists guess the planet could harbor more than a million yet-to-be-discovered viruses. Bacteria are even trickier, and so we probably know about even fewer of them. Perhaps scariest are those that live within us, peacefully for now. More than 99% of even those bacteria inside human bodies are presently unknown to science, which means we are operating in near-total ignorance about the effects climate change might have on the box in, for instance, our guts, about how many of the bacteria modern humans have come to rely on, like unseen factory workers, for everything from digesting our food to modulating our anxiety, could be revived, diminished, or entirely killed off by an additional few degrees of heat. Overwhelmingly, of course, the viruses and bacteria making homes inside us are non threatening to humans at present. Presumably, a difference of a degree or two in global temperature won't dramatically change the behavior of the majority of them. Probably the vast majority, even the overwhelming majority. But consider the case of the saiga, the adorable drop-like antelope native to Central Asia. In May 2015, nearly two-thirds of the global population died in the span of just days. Every single saiga in an area the size of Florida, the land suddenly dotted with hundreds of thousands of saiga carcasses and not one lone survivor. And even like this is called a mega death. This one so striking and cinematic that it gave rise immediately to a whole raft of conspiracy theories. Aliens, radiation, dumped rocket fuel. But no toxins were found by researchers poking through the killing fields in the animal themselves, in the soil, in the local plants. The culprit, it turned out, was a simple bacteria, Pasteurella multicida, which had lived inside the saiga's tonsils without threatening its host in any way for many, many generations. Suddenly, it had proliferated, immigrated to the bloodstream, and from there to the animal's liver, kidneys, and spleen. Why? The places where the saigas died in May 2015 were extremely warm and humid. Ed Young wrote, in the Atlantic. 
In fact, the humidity levels were the highest ever seen in the region since records began in 1948. The same pattern held for two earlier and much smaller die-offs from 1981 and 1988. When the temperature gets really hot and the air gets really wet, saiga die. Climate is the trigger. Pasteurella is the bullet. This is not to say we now understand what precisely about humidity weaponized Pasteurella or how many of the other bacteria living inside mammals like us, the 1% we have identified, or perhaps more worryingly, the 99% we house without any knowledge or understanding might be similarly triggered by climate friendly, symbiotic bugs with whom we have lived in some cases for millions of years, transformed suddenly into contagions already inside us. That remains a mystery, but ignorance is no comfort. Presumably climate change will introduce us to some of them. Economic Collapse the murmuring mantra of global markets, which prevailed between the end of Cold War and the onset of the Great Recession, promising something like their own eternal reign, is that economic growth will save us from anything and everything. But in the aftermath of 2008 crash, a number of historians and iconoclastic economists studying what they call fossil capitalism have started to suggest that the entire history of shift economic growth, which began somewhat suddenly in the 18th century, is not the result of innovation or the dynamics of free trade, but simply our discovery of fossil fuels and all their raw power, a one-time injection of that new value into a system that had previously been characterized by unending subsistence living. This is a minority view among economists and yet pricey version of the perspective is quite powerful. Before fossil fuels, nobody lived better than their parents or grandparents or ancestors from 500 years before, except in the immediate aftermath of a great plague like a black death, which allowed the lucky survivors to gobble up the resources liberated by mass graves. In the West especially, we tend to believe we are invented our way out of that endless zero-sum, scratch and claw resource scramble both with particular innovations like the steam engine and computer, and with the development of a dynamic capitalistic system to reward them. But scholars like Andreas Malm have different perspective. We have been extracted from that mug only by a singular innovation one engineered not by entrepreneurial human hands, but in fact millions of years before the first one ever dug at the earth, engineered by time and geologic weight, which many millennia ago pressed the fossils of earth's earlier carbon-based life forms, plants, small animals into petroleum like lemon under a press. Oil is the patrimony of the planet's pre-human past, what stored energy the earth can produce when undisturbed for millennia. As soon as humans discovered that storehouse, they set about plundering it so fast that at various points over the last half century, oil forecasters have panicked about running out. In 1968, the labor historian Eric Hobsbawm wrote, whoever says industrial revolution says cotton. Today, he would probably substitute fossil fuel. The timeline of growth is just about perfectly consistent with the burning of those fields. Though doctrinaire economists would argue there is much more to equation of growth. Generations being as long as they are and historical memory as short, the waste several centuries of relatively reliable and expanding prosperity have endowed economic growth with the reassuring aura of permanence. We expect it on some continents at least and raise against our leaders and elites when it does not come. But planetary history is very long, and human history, though a briefer interval, is long too. And while the pace of technological change we call progress is today dizzying and may yet invent new ways of buffering us from the blows of climate change, it is also not hard to imagine those flood centuries enjoyed by nations who colonized the rest of the planet to produce them as an aberration. Earlier, empires had boom years too. You do not have to believe that economic growth is a mirage produced by fossil fumes to worry that climate change is a threat to it. In fact, 
this proposes and forms the corner stone around which an entire edifice of academic literature has been built over the last decade. The most exciting research on the economics of warming has come from Solomon Sien and Marcel Burr and Edward Miguel, who are not historians of fossil capitalism, but who offer some very bleak analysis of their own. In a country that's already relatively warm, every degree Celsius of warming reduces growth on average by about 1% point. This is the sterling work in the field. Compared to the trajectory of economic growth with no climate change, their average projection is for a 23% loss in per capita earning globally by the end of this century. Tracing the shape of the probability curve is even scarier. There is a 51% chance. This research suggests that climate change will reduce global output by more than 20% by 2100, compared with a world without warming, and a 12% chance that it lowers per capita GDP by 50% or more by then, unless emissions decline. By comparison, the Great Depression dropped global GDP by about 15%. It is estimated the numbers weren't so good back then. The more recent Great Recession lowered it by about 2% in a one-time shock. Siang and his colleagues estimate a 1 in 8 chance of an ongoing and irreversible effect by 2100, that is 25 times worse. In 2018, a team led by Thomas Stroik suggested that these estimates could be dramatic underestimates. The scale of that economic devastation is hard to comprehend. Even within the post-industrial nations of the wealthy West, where economic indicators such as the unemployment rate and GDP growth circulate as though they contain the whole meaning of life in them, figures like this are a little bit hard to fathom. We have become so used to economic stability and reliable growth that the entire spectrum of conceivability stretches from contractions of about 15%, effects we study still in histories of the depression to growth about half as fast, about 7%, which the world as a whole last achieved during the global boom of early 1960s. These are exceptional one-time peaks and troughs, extending for no more than a few years, and most of the time we measure economic fluctuations in ticks of decimal points, 2.9 this year, 2.7 that. What climate change proposes is an economic setback of an entirely different category. The breakdown by country is perhaps even more alarming. There are places that benefit in the north where warmer temperatures can improve agriculture and economic productivity. Canada, Russia, Scandinavia, Greenland. But in the mid-latitudes, the countries that produce the bulk of the world's economic activity, the United States, China, lose nearly half of their potential output. The warming near the equator is worse, with losses throughout Africa, from Mexico to Brazil, and in India and Southeast Asia approaching 100%. India alone, one study proposed, would shoulder nearly a quarter of the economic suffering inflicted on the entire world by climate change. In 2018, the World Bank estimates that the current part of carbon emissions would sharply diminish the living conditions of 800 million living throughout the South Asia. 100 million, they say, will be dragged into extreme poverty by climate change just over the next decade. Perhaps back into is more appropriate. Many of the most vulnerable are those populations that have just extracted themselves from deprivation and subsistence living through developing world growth powered by industrialization and fossil fuel. And to help buffer or offset the impacts, we have no New Deal revival waiting around the corner. No Marshall Plan ready. The global halving of economic resources would be permanent. And because permanent, we would soon not even know it as deprivation. Only as a brutally cruel normal against which we might measure tiny burbs of decimal point growth as the breed of new prosperity. We have gotten used to setbacks on our erratic Mars along the arc of economic history, but we know them as setbacks and expect elastic recoveries. What climate change has in store is not that kind of thing, not a great recession or a great depression, but in economic terms, a great dying. How could that come to be? The answer is partly in the preceding chapters.
natural disaster, flooding, public health crisis. All of these are not just tragedies, but expensive ones, and beginning already to accumulate at an unprecedented rate. There is the cost to agriculture. More than 3 million Americans work on more than 2 million farms. If yields decline by 40%, margins will decline too. In many cases, disappearing entirely. The small farms and cooperatives and even empires of agribusinesses slipping underwater and drowning under depth all those who own and work those arid fields. Many of them old enough to remember the same plains A's of plenty. And then there is the real flooding. 2.4 million American homes and businesses, representing more than $1 trillion in present-day value, will suffer chronic flooding by 2100, according to a 2018 study by the Union of Concerned Scientists. 14% of the real estate in Miami Beach could be flooded by just 2045. This is just within America, though it isn't only South Florida. In fact, over the next few decades, the real estate impact will be almost $30 billion in New Jersey alone. There is a direct hit cost to growth, as there is to health. Some of these effects we can see already. For instance, the wrapping of train tracks or the grounding of flights due to temperatures so high that they abolish the aerodynamics that allow planes to take off, which is now commonplace at heat strike in airports like the one in Phoenix. From Switzerland to Finland, heat waves have necessitated the closure of power plants when cooling liquids have become too hot to do their job. And in India, in 2012, 670 million lost power when the country's grid was overwhelmed by farmers irrigating their fields without the help of the monsoon season, which never arrived. In all but the sinus projects in all, but the wealthiest part of the world. The planet's infrastructure was simply not built for climate change, which means the vulnerabilities are everywhere you look. Other, less obvious effects are also visible. For instance, productivity. For the past few decades, economists have wondered why the computer revolution and the internet have not brought meaningful productivity gains to the industrialized world. Spreadsheets, database management software, email, those innovations alone would seem to promise huge gains in efficiency for any business or economy adopting them. But those gains simply haven't materialized. In fact, the economic period in which those innovations were introduced, along with literally thousands of similar computer-driven efficiencies, have been characterized, especially in the developed West, by wage and productivity stagnation and dampened economic growth. One speculative possibility, computers have made us more effective and productive. But at the same time, climate change has had the opposite effect, diminishing or wiping out entirely impact of technology. How could this be? One theory is the negative cognitive effects of direct heat and air pollution, both of which are accumulating more research support by the day. And whether or not that theory explains the great stagnation of the last several decades, we do know that, globally, warmer temperatures do dampen worker productivity. The claim seems both far-fetched and intuitive, since on the one hand, you don't imagine a few bricks of temperature would turn entire economics into zombie markets, and since on the other, you yourself have surely labored at work on a hot day with the air conditioning out and understand how hard that can be. The bigger picture perspective is harder to solo, at least at first. It may sound like geographic determinism, but Siank, Berg, and Miguel have identified an optimal annual average temperature for economic productivity, 13 degrees Celsius, which just so happens to be the historical median for the United States and several other of the world's biggest economies. Today, the US climate hovers around 13.4 degrees which translates into less than 1% of GDP loss though. Like compound interest, the effects grow over time. Of course, as the country has warmed over the last decades, particular reasons have seen their temperature rise, some of them from suboptimal levels to something closer to an ideal setting climate-wise. The greater San Francisco Bay Area, for instance, is sitting pretty right now, at exactly 13 degrees. This is what it means to suggest that climate change is an enveloping crisis, 
one that touches every aspect of the way we live on the planet today. But the world's suffering will be disrupted as unequally as it profits, with greater divergence both between countries and within them. Already, hot countries like India and Pakistan will be hurt the most. Within the United States, the cost will be soldered largely in the South and Midwest, where some regions could lose up to 20% of country income. Overall, though it will be hard hit by climate impacts, the United States is among the most well positioned to endure. Its wealth and geography are the reasons that America has only begun to register effects of climate change that already plague warmer and poorer parts of the world. But in part because it has so much to lose and in part because it so aggressively developed its very long coastlines, the United States is more vulnerable to climate impacts than any country in the world but India. And its economic illness won't be quarantined at the border. In a globalized world, there is what Zheng Tao Chang and others call an economic ripple effect. They have also quantified it and found that the impact grows along with warming. At 1 degree Celsius, with a decline in American GDP of 0.88%, global GDP would fall by 0.12%. The American loses cascading through the world system. At 2 degrees, the economic ripple effect triples, though here too, the effects play out differently in different parts of the world compared to the impact of American losses at 1 degree. At 2 degrees, the economic ripple effect in China would be 4.5 times larger. The radiating shock waves issuing out from other countries are smaller, because their economies are smaller, but the waves will be coming from nearly every country in the world, like radio signals beamed out from a whole global forest of towers is transmitting economic suffering. For better or for worse, in the countries of the wealthy West, we have settled on economic growth as the single base metric, however imperfect of the health of our societies. Of course, using that metric, climate change registers with its wildfire and drought and famines, it registers seismically. The costs are astronomical already, with single hurricanes now delivering damage in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Should the planet warm 3.7 degrees, one assessment suggests climate change damages could total $551 trillion, nearly twice as much wealth as exists in the world today. We are on track for more warming still. Over the last several decades, policy consensus has cautioned that the world would only tolerate responses to climate change if they were free or even better if they could be presented as avenues of economic opportunity. That market logic was probably always short-sighted, but over the last several years, as the cost of adaptation in the form of green energy has fallen so dramatically, the equation has entirely flipped. We now know that it will be much, much more expensive to not act on climate than to take even the most aggressive action today. If you don't think of the price of a stock or government bond as an insurmountable barrier to the returns you will receive, you probably shouldn't think of climate adaptation as expensive either. In 2018, one paper calculated the global cost of a rapid energy transition by 2030 to be negative $26 trillion. In other words, rebuilding the energy infrastructure of the world would make us all that much money compared to a static system in only a dozen years. Every day, we do not act. Those costs accumulate and the numbers quickly compound. Xiang, Burke, and Miguel draw their 50% figure from the very high end of what's possible, truly a worst case scenario for economic growth under the sign of climate change. But in 2018, Burke and several other colleagues published a major paper exploring the growth consequences of some scenarios closer to our present predicament. In it, they considered one plausible but still quite optimistic scenario in which the world meets its Paris Agreement commitments, limiting warming to between 2.5 and 3 degrees. This is probably about the best case warming scenario we might reasonably expect. Globally, relative to a world with no additional warming, it would cut per capita economic output by the end of the century. 
Burke and his colleagues estimate by between 15 and 25 percent. Hitting 4 degrees of warming, which lies on the low end of the range of warming implied by our current emissions trajectory, would cut into it by 30 percent or more. This is a trough twice as deep as the deprivation that scared our grandparents in the 1930s and which helped produce a wave of fascism, authoritarianism and genocide. But you can only really call it a trough when you climb out of it and look back from a new peak, relieved. There may not be any such relief or reprieve from climate deprivation and though, as in any collapse, there will be those few who find ways to benefit. The experience of most may not be more like that of miners, buried permanently at the bottom of a shaft. Climate Conflict Climatologists are very careful when talking about Syria. They want you to know that while climate change did produce a drought that contributed to the country's civil war, it is not exactly fair to say that the conflict is the result of warming. Next door, for instance, Lebanon suffered the same crop failures and remained stable. But wars are not caused by climate change only in the same way that hurricanes are not caused by climate change, which is to say they are made more likely, which is to say the distinction is semantic. If climate change makes conflict only 3% more likely in a given country, that does not mean it is a trivial effect. There are almost 200 countries in the world which multiplies the likelihood, meaning that rise in temperature could yield three or four or six more wars. Over the last decade, researchers have even managed to quantify some of the non-obvious relationships between temperature and violence. For every half degree of warming, they say, societies will see between a 10 and 20% increase in a likelihood of armed conflict. In climate science, nothing is simple. But the arithmetic is harrowing. A planet 4 degrees warmer would have perhaps twice as many wars as we do today, and likely more. As is the case with nearly every aspect of climate chaos, meeting the Paris goals will not save us from this bloodshed. In fact, far from it. Even an astronizing, improbable effort to limit warming to 2 degrees would still, by this math, result in at least 40% and perhaps as much as 80% more war. This, in other words, is our best case scenario. At least half again as much conflict as we see today, when few watching the news each night would say, we are enjoying an abundance of peace. Already, climate change has elevated Africa's risk of conflict by more than 10%. In that continent, by just 2030, projected temperatures are expected to cause 393,000 additional deaths in battle. Battle, the word feels like a relic when you come across it. In the worldly West, we have come to pretend that war is an anomalous feature of modern life, since it seems to have been retired as fully from our everyday experience as polio. But globally, there are 19 ongoing armed conflicts hot enough to claim at least a thousand lives each year. Nine of them began more recently as 2010, and many more unfold at smaller scales of violence. That all of these counts are expected to spike in the coming decades is one reason that, as nearly every climate scientist I've spoken to has pointed out, the US military is obsessed with climate change. The Pentagon is seeing regular climate trade assessments and planning for a new era of conflict governed by global warming. The drowning of American Navy bases by sea level rise is trouble enough and the melting of the Arctic promises to open an entirely new theater of conflict, once nearly as foreign seeming as the space race. It also positions the country primarily against America's old rivals, the Russians, now revived as adversaries. Given the right war gaming cast of mind, it is also possible to see the aggressive Chinese construction activity in the South China Sea, where whole new artificial islands have been erected for military use, as a kind of dry run, so to speak, for life as a superpower in a flooded world. The strategic opportunity is clear, with so many of the existing footholds, like all those low-lying islands the United States once used to stepping stone its own empire across the Pacific, expected to disappear by the end of the century, if not before. <laughs>
The Marshall Islands archipelago, for instance, seized by the U.S. during World War II, could be rendered uninhabitable by sea level rise as soon as mid-century. The U.S. Geological Survey has warned its island will be underwater even if we meet the Paris goals. And what is taken down with them is quite scary. Beginning with the bombing at Bikini Atoll, these islands were ground zero for American atom bombs. Testing just after the war, the US military has only ever cleaned up one island of radioactivity, which makes them the world's largest nuclear waste site. But for the military, climate change is not just a matter of great power rivalry executed across a transformed map. Even for those in the American military who expect the country's hegemony to endure indefinitely, climate change presents a problem because being the world's policeman is quite a bit harder when the crime rates double. And it's not just Syria where climate has contributed to conflict. Some speculate that the elevated level of strife across the Middle East over the past generation reflects the pressure of global warming. A hypothesis all the more cruel considering that warming began to accelerate when the industrialized world extracted and then burned the reasons well. From Boko Haram to ISIS to the Taliban and militant Islamic groups in Pakistan, drought and crop failure have been linked to radicalization and the effect may be especially pronounced amid ethnic strife. From 1990 to 2010, a 2016 study found 23% of conflict in the world's ethically diverse countries began in months stemmed by weather disaster. According to one assessment, 32 countries from Haiti to Philippines and India to Cambodia, each heavily dependent on farming and agriculture face extreme risk of conflict and civil unrest from climate disruption over the next 30 years. What accounts for the relationship between climate and conflict? Some of it comes down to agriculture and economics. When yields drop and productivity falls, societies can falter. And when drought and heat waves hit, the shocks can be felt even more deeply, electrifying political fault lines and producing or exposing others no one knew to worry over. A lot has to do with the forced migration that can result from these shocks. And with the political and social instability that migration often produces, when things go south, those who are able to flee not always to the places ready to welcome them. In fact, recent history shows quite often the opposite. And today, migration is already at a record high, with almost 70 million displaced people wandering the planet right now. That is the outbound impact, but the local one is often more profound. Those who remain in a region ravaged by extreme weather often find themselves navigating an entirely new social and political structure, if one endures at all. And it is not just weak states that fall at the hands of climate pressures. In recent years, scholars have compiled a long list of empires buckled, at least in part by climate effects and events. Egypt, Acadia, Rome. This complex calculus is what makes researchers reluctant to assign blame for conflict neatly. But complexity is how warming articulates its brutality. Like the cost to growth, war is not a discrete impact of global temperature rise, but something more like an all-encompassing aggregation of climate change, war's tremor, and cascades. The Center for Climate and Security, a state-focused think tank, organizes the threat from climate change into six categories. Catch 22 states, in which governments have responded to local climate challenges, to agriculture, for example, by turning towards a global marketplace that is now more than ever vulnerable to climate shocks. Brittle states, stable on the surface, but only by a run of good climate luck. Fragile states, such as Sudan, Yemen, and Bangladesh, where climate impacts have already eaten into trust in state authority, or worse, disputed zones among states, like the South China Sea or Arctic, disappearing states, which they mean literally as in the case of the Maldives, and non-state actors, like ISIS, which can seize local resources, such as fresh water, as a way of applying leverage against the normal state authority or the local population. In each case, climate is not the sole cause but the spark igniting a complex bundle of social kindling. This complexity may also be one reason we cannot see the trait of skeleton war very clearly. Choosing to regard conflict 
as something determined primarily by politics and economics when all three are in fact governed like everything else by the conditions established by our rapidly changing climate. Over the last decade or so, the linguist Steven Pinker has made a second career out of suggesting that in the West especially, we are unable to appreciate human progress, are in fact blind to all of the massive and rapid improvements the world has witnessed in less violence and war and poverty, reduced infant mortality and enhanced life expectancy. It's true, we are. When you look at the charts, the trajectory of that progress seems inarguable. So many fewer violent deaths, so much less extreme deprivation, a global middle class expanding by the hundreds of millions. But again, that story is about the wealth brought by industrialization and the transformation of societies by newfound wealth powered by fossil fuel. It's a story written largely by China and to a lesser extent the rest of the developing world, which has developed by industrializing. And the cost of much of that progress, the balance come due for all the industrialization that made middle classness possible for the billions of people in the global south, is climate change, which we are, ironically, far too sanguine about, Pinker included. Worse still, the warming unleashed by all our progress heralds a return to violence. Even when it comes to war, historical memory has a sadistically short half-life, horrors, and their causes gauzily evanescing into familiar folklore in less than the span of a single generation. But most wars throughout the history, it is important to remember, have been conflicts over resources, often ignited by resource scarcity, which is what an earth densely populated and denuded by climate change will yield. Those wars don't tend to increase those resources. Most of the time, they incinerate them. The folklore of state conflict cast a long shadow, a patchwork quilt of nations tucked apart into a ghastly, mutually damaging disarray. Climate talks at the individual traits of conflict too, personal irritability, interpersonal conflict, domestic violence. Heat frays everything. It increases violent crime rates, swearing on social media and the likelihood that a major league pitcher coming to the mound after his teammate has been hit by a pitch, will hit an opposing batter in retaliation. The hotter it gets, the longer drivers will honk their horns in frustration. And even in stimulations, police officers are more likely to fire on intruders when the exercises are conducted in the hotter weather. By 2099, one speculative paper tabulated climate change in the United States would bring about an additional 22,000 murders, 180,000 rapes, 2.5 million assaults, and 3.76 million robberies, burglaries, and acts of larceny. The statics of the past are more inarguable, and even the arrival of air conditioning in the developed world in the middle of the last century did little to solve the problem of the summer crime wave. It's not just temperature effects. In 2018, a team of researchers examining an enormous data set of more than 9,000 American cities found that air pollution levels positively predicted incidents of every single crime category they looked at, from car theft and burglary and larceny up to assault, rape and murder. And then there are the ways that climate impacts can cascade into violence more circuitously. Between 2008 and 2010, Guatemala was hit by Tropical Storm Otter, Hurricane Dolly, Tropical Storm Agatha, and Tropical Storm Hermine. This, a country that was already one of the 10 most affected by extreme weather and reeling in the same years from the eruption of a local volcano and a regional earthquake. All told, almost 3 million were left food insecure and at least 400,000 needed humanitarian assistance from the 2010 disasters alone. The country sustained damages totaling more than a billion dollars, or roughly a quarter of the national budget, devastating its roads and supply chains. In 2011, it was hit by tropical storm 12E, and in the wake of the disasters, farmers turned to growing poppies, organized crime, already an enormous problem, exploded, which would perhaps not surprise us, given that recent research has shown that the Sicilian Mafia was produced by drought. Today, Guatemala has the fifth highest homicide rate in the world. According to UNICEF, it is the second most dangerous country in the world for children, 
Historically, the country's cash crops have been coffee and sugarcane. In the coming decades, climate change could make both of them ungrayable. Systems What I call cascades, climate scientists call systems crisis. These crises are what the American military means when it names climate change a threat multiplier. The multiplication when it falls short of conflict produces migration, that is, climate refugees. Since 2008, by one count, it has already produced 22 million of them. In the West, we often think of refugees as a failed state problem. That is, a problem that the broken and impoverished parts of the world inflict on relatively more stable and wealthier societies. But Hurricane Harvey produced at least 60,000 climate migrants in Texas, and Hurricane Irma forced the evacuation of nearly 7 million. As with so much else, it will only get worse from here. By 2100, sea level rise alone could displace 13 million Americans, a few percent of the country's total population. Many of those sea level refugees will come from the country's southeast, chiefly Florida, where 2.5 million are expected to be flooded out of Greater Miami and Louisiana, where the New Orleans area is predicted to lose half a million. As an unusually wealthy country, the United States is for now unusually suited to withstand such disruptions. One can almost imagine, over the course of a century, tens of millions of resettled Americans adapting to a ravaged coastline and a new geography for the country. Almost. But warming is not just a matter of sea level, and its horror will not hit nations like the United States first. In fact, the impacts will be greatest in the world's least developed, most impoverished, and therefore least resilient nations. Almost literally, a story of the world's rich drowning the world's poor with their waste. The first country to industrialize and produce greenhouse gas on a grand scale, the United Kingdom, is expected to suffer the least from climate change. The world's slowest developing countries, producing the least emissions, will be among those hardest hit. The climate system of the Democratic Republic of Congo, one of the world's poorest countries, is scheduled to be especially profoundly perturbed. The Congo is mostly landlocked and mountainous, but in the next generation of warming, those features will not be protections. Wealth will be a buffer for some countries, but not a safeguard, as Australia is learning already. By far, the richest of all the countries starting down the most intense, most immediate warming barrages, it is an early test case of how the world's affluent societies will bend or buckle or rebuild under the pressure of temperature changes likely to hit the rest of the well-off world only later this century. The country was founded on genocidal indifference to the native landscape and those who inhabited it, and its modern ambitions have already been precarious. Australia is today a society of expensive abundance, jerry rigged onto a very harsh and ecologically unforgiving land. In 2011, a single heat wave there produced significant tree dieback and coral bleaching. The death of the plant life, crashes in local bird populations, and dramatic spikes in the number of certain insects, and transformations of ecosystems, both marine and terrestrial. When the country enacted a carbon tax, its emission fell. When under political pressure, the tax was repealed, they rose again. In 2018, the country's parliament declared global warming a current and existential national security risk. A few months later, its climate-conscious prime minister was forced to resign for the shame of attempting to honor the Paris Accords. The wills of all communities are greased by abundance, baked by deprivation, they all stall and crack. The paths are familiar ones, even to those who have only ever known affluence. Their lives, criminally fictionless and stimulated by entertainments tracing the arc of social decline. Market breakdowns, price gouging, the hoarding of goods and services by the well-off and well-armed. The retreat of law enforcement into self-enrichment and the disappearance of any expectation of justice making survival suddenly a matter of entrepreneurial skill. More than 140 million people in just three regions of the world will be made climate migrants by 2050, the World Bank projected in a 2018 study. Assuming current warming and emissions trends, 86 million in sub-Saharan Africa, 
40 million in South Asia and 17 million in Latin America. The most commonly cited estimate from the United States International Organization for Migration suggests numbers a bit higher, 200 million total by 2050. These figures are quite high, higher than most known advocates credit. But according to the UNIOM, climate change may unleash as many as a billion migrants on the world by 2050. One billion, that is about as many people as live today in North and South America combined. Imagine the two continents suddenly drowned in the sea and whole new world submerged and everyone left bobbing at the surface now fighting for a foothold. Somewhere, anywhere. And if someone else is scrambling for the same dry spot, scrambling to get there first. The system in crisis is not always society. The system can also be the body. Historically in the United States, more than two-thirds of outbreaks of waterborne disease illnesses smuggled into humans through algae and bacteria that can produce gastrointestinal problems were preceded by unusually intense rainfall, disrupting local water supplies. The concentration of salmonella in streams, for instance, increases significantly after heavy rainfall and the country's most dramatic outbreak of waterborne disease came in 1993, when more than 400,000 in Milwaukee fell ill from Cryptosporidium immediately after a storm. Sudden rainfall shocks, both deluges and their opposite, droughts, can devastate agricultural communities economically, but also produce what scientists call, with understatement, nutritional deficiencies in fetuses and infants. In Vietnam, those who passed through that cubicle early on and survived were soon to start school later in life, do worse when they got there and grow less tall than their peers. In India, the same cycle of poverty pattern holds. The lifelong impact of chronic malnutrition are more troubling still for being permanent, diminishing cognitive ability, flattened adult wages, increased morbidity. In Ecuador, climate damage has been seen even in middle-class children who bear the mark of rainfall shocks and extreme temperatures on their wages 20 to 60 years after the fact. The effects begin in the womb and they are universal with measurable declines in lifetime earnings for every day over 90 degrees during a baby's 9 months in utero. The impacts accumulate later in life too. An enormous study in Taiwan found that for every single unit of additional air pollution, the relative risk of Alzheimer's doubled. Similar patterns have been observed from Ontario to Mexico City. As conditions of environmental degradation become more universal, it may perversely require more imagination to consider their cost. When the deprived are no longer outlier communities, but instead whole regions, whole countries, Conditions that once may have seemed inhuman now appear to a future generation who knows no better simply normal. In the past, we have looked into horror at the stunned growth of national populations who passed through famines, both natural and man-made. In the future, climate change may stunt us all in one way or another, with no control group entirely spared. You might expect these premonitions to settle like sediments into family planning. And indeed, among the young and well-off in Europe and the United States, for whom reproductive choices are often freighted with political meaning, they have. Among this outwardly conscientious cohort, there is much worry about bringing new children into a degraded world, full of suffering, and about contributing to the problem by crowding the climate states with more players each a little consumption machine. Want to fight climate change? The Guardian asked in 2017. Have fewer children. That year and the next, the paper published several variations on the theme, as did many other publications delivered to the lifestyle class, including the New York Times. And this is to the list of decisions affected by climate change. Should I have children? The effect on the personal decisions of the consumer's class is perhaps a narrow way of thinking about global warming, though it demonstrates a strain of strange ascetic pride among the well-to-do. But of course, further degradation isn't inescapable. It is optional. Each new baby arrives in a brand new world, contemplating a whole horizon of possibilities. The perspective is not naive. We live in the world with them, helping make it for them.
and with them and for ourselves. The next decades are not yet determined. A new timer begins with every birth, measuring how much more damage will be done to the planet and the life this child will live on it. The horizons are just as open to us, however foreclosed and foreordained they may seem. But we close them off when we say anything about the future being inevitable. What may sound like stoic wisdom is often an alibi for indifference. In a world of suffering, the self-interested mind craves compartmentalization. And one of the most interesting frontiers of emerging climate science traces the imprint left on our psychological well-being by the force of global warming, which can overwhelm whatever methods we devise to cope, that is, the mental health effects of a world on fire. Perhaps the most predictable vector is trauma. Between a quarter and a half of all those exposed to extreme weather events will experience them as an ongoing negative shock to their mental health. In England, flooding was found to quadruple levels of psychological distress. Even among those in an inundated community but not personally affected by the flooding. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, 62% of evacuees extended the diagnostic threshold for acute stress disorder. In the region as a whole, nearly a third had PTSD. Wildfires curiously yielded a lower incidence. Just 24% of evacuees in the aftermath of one series of California blazes. But a third of those who lived through fire were diagnosed in its aftermath with depression. Even those watching the effects from the sidelines suffer from climate trauma. I don't know of a single scientist that's not having an emotional reaction to what is being lost. Camille Parmesan, who shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore, has said, Grist has called the phenomenon climate depression, scientific American environmental grief. And while it may seem intuitive that those contemplating the end of the world find themselves despairing, especially when their calls of alarm has gone almost entirely unheeded, it is also a harrowing forecast of what is in store for the rest of the world, as the devastation of climate change slowly reveals itself. In the sense of psychological distress, which so many of them endure, climate scientists are the canaries in our coal mine. This may be why so many of them seem concerned with the risk of crying wolf about warming. They have learned enough about public apathy to worry themselves into knots about just when and precisely how to raise the alarm. In the certain places, that alarm has been raised for them. Those studying the phenomenon are only suffering secondhand which is a sign of just how intense the first-hand impact has been. Unsurprisingly, climate trauma is especially harsh in the young. In this, our folk wisdom about the impressionable minds of children is reliable. 32 weeks after Hurricane Andrew hit Florida in 1992, killing 40, more than half of children surveyed had moderate PTSD, and more than a third had a severe form. In the high-impact areas, 70% of children scored in the moderate to severe range fully 21 months after the Category 5 storm. By this small contrast, soldiers returning from war are estimated to suffer from PTSD at a rate between 11 and 31%. One especially detailed study examined the mental health fallout from Hurricane Mitch, a Category 5 storm and the second deadliest Atlantic hurricane on record, which struck Central America in 1998, leaving 11,000 dead. In Pozoltega, the most hard-hit region of Nicaragua, children had a 27% chance of having been seriously injured, a 31% chance of having lost a family member, and a 63% chance of their home having been damaged or destroyed. You can imagine the after effects. 90% of adolescents in the area were left with PTSD, with the average adolescent boy registering at the high end of the range of severe PTSD and the average teenage girl registering over the threshold of very severe. Six months after the storm, four out of every five teenage survivors from Postaltega suffered from depression. More than half, the study found, compulsively nursed what the authors called a bit euphemistically vengeful thoughts. And then there are the more surprising mental health costs. Climate affects both the onset and the severity of depression, the Lancet has found. 
Rising temperature and humidity are married in the data to emergency room visits for mental health issues. When it's hotter out, psychiatric hospitals see spikes in proper inpatient admissions as well. Schizophrenics especially are admitted at much higher rates when the temperatures are higher and inside those hospitals, ward temperature significantly increases symptom severity in schizophrenic patients. Heat waves bring waves of other things too. Mood disorders, anxiety disorders, dementia. Heat produces violence and conflict between people, we know, and so it should probably not surprise us that it also generates a spike in violence against oneself. Each increase of a single degree Celsius in monthly temperature is associated with almost a percentage point rise of the suicide rate in the United States and more than 2% points in Mexico. An unmitigated emission scenario could produce 40,000 additional suicides in these countries by 2050. One startling paper by Tamma Carleton has suggested that global warming is already responsible for 59,000 suicides, many of them farmers in India, where one-fifth of all the world's suicides now occur, and where suicide rates have doubled since 1980. When temperatures are already high, she found a rise of just one additional degree on a single day will produce 70 additional corpses is dead by the farmer's own hand. If you have made it this far, you are a brave reader. Any one of these 12 chapters contain, by rights, enough horror to induce a panic attack in even the most optimistic of those considering it. But you are not merely considering it, you are about to embark on living it. In many cases, in many places, we already are. In fact, what is perhaps more remarkable about all of the research summarized to this point concerning not only refugees, health and mental health, but also conflict and food supply and sea level and all of the other elements of climate disarray is that it is research emerging from the world we know today. That is, a world just one degree warmer, a world not yet deformed and defaced beyond recognition a world bound largely by convention devised in an age of climate stability, now barreling headlong into an age of something more like climate chaos, a world we are only beginning to perceive. Some climate research is speculative, of course, projecting our best insights into physical processes and human dynamics into planetary conditions no human being of any age or era has ever experienced. Some of these predictions will surely be falsified. That is how science proceeds. But all of our science arises from precedent, and the next era for climate change has none. The twelve elements of climate chaos are, as Donald Rumsfeld once put it in his incongruously useful phrasing, the known knowns. This is the least concerning category. There are two more. These cases may feel exhaustive, at times even overwhelming, but they are merely sketches to be filled in and fleshed out over the coming decades. If the previous decades are any guide, more often by bleaker signs than by reassuring findings. For all our earned confidence in our knowledge of global warming, that it is real, that it is anthropogenic, that it is driving sea level rise and arctic melt and the rest, we still know only so much. Twenty years ago, there was no meaningful research on the relationship between climate change and economic growth. Ten years ago, not much about climate and conflict. Fifty years ago, there was hardly any research about climate change whatsoever. The pace of that scholarship is exhilarating, but it also counsels humility. There remains so much we do not know about the way global warming affects the way we live today. Now picture how much we will know 50 years from now and how much more gruesome our self-immolation will likely seem even if we avoid its worst outcomes. Will warming trigger rapid feedback loops powered by the release of arctic methane or by the dramatic slowdown of the ocean's circulation system? It's impossible to say for sure. Will we protect ourselves by dispersing sulfur into our own now-red atmosphere, subjecting the entire planet to the uncertain health effects of those particles, or by erecting carbon-sucking plantations the size of continents? It's difficult to predict. These, then, are among the known unknowns. And that oracle Rumsfeld furnished us with one conceptual category, scarier still.
which all means that these twelve traits described in these twelve chapters yield a portrait of the future only as best as it can be painted in the present. What actually lies ahead may prove even grimmer, though the reverse, of course, is also possible. The map of our new world will be drawn in part by natural processes that remain mysterious, but more definitely by human hands. At what point will the climate crisis grow undeniable, uncompartmentalizable? How much damage will have already been selfishly done? How quickly will we act to save ourselves and preserve as much of the way of life we know today as possible? For the sake of clarity, I have treated each of the threats from climate change, sea level rise, food scarcity, economic stagnation as discrete threats, which they are not. Some may prove offsetting some mutually reinforcing and others merely adjacent. But together, they form a lattice work of climate crisis beneath which at least some humans and probably many billions will live. How?